Yes, guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Daily Dose podcast. Today, we have not only another special guest, but the GOAT, in my opinion, my favourite battler of all time, someone I've been waiting to get on the show for a while, Mr. Two Times Everything, the Saurus. What's good, man? What's good? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the kind words, of course. I am happy that we can finally make it happen. And uh, yeah, man, I'm glad that you're doing well out there. Shout out to everybody tuning in. Hope y'all are staying safe. Uh, Yeah, man, let's go. Definitely. No, thank you for taking the time to come on, man. I really appreciate it. And no problem. Like, Likewise. The the questions that I've generally been asking on the show have been I've I've had a lot of people on that are just getting started in battle rap, really. So yeah. they are going to be very difficult for yourself to answer at points, to be honest. No but, at all. I uh, you know I I feel like I'm still. Uh, pretty well in tune with with the scene as a whole and I try to stay on the up and up as much as I can with uh, at least you know who is sort of dictating the pace of the action what's what uh, what battlers and what styles are sort of you know becoming the the prevalent ones in, in any given like time it's sort of like the way the scene works is sort of in cycles and certain things become the it thing for the moment and then you know three months from now or four months from now we'll see a different element which has always been a popular element of battling resurge and again become the 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 popular thing to do at the time you know that's sort of just how it works it all works in cycles definitely yeah man it's uh it's a it's a crazy thing to follow at times to be fair but it is it absolutely is it's got like wrestling elements it's got like soap opera, which I guess you could draw from the wrestling elements as well. And then you also have just the plain competitive side of it. Uh, so you have, you know, like sport fans of, of all degrees who are a fan just because of the competitive nature. You have the, 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 like the, the language aspect of it too. It's, it's really is just uh, there's so many different layers that uh appeal to so many different people across the board you know definitely and it's it's it really is like one of the the most underappreciated art forms in that sense as well like i i've been saying to a few people recently like i've i've been i've been a battle rap fan now for roughly around 11 to 12 years um i discovered it when i was still like halfway through secondary school and I've been pretty much obsessed with it ever since. But the whole time that I've been a battle rap fan, I've never been to an event with a friend or anything like that. I go to every event on my own and still end up having an incredible time and meeting so many people. Because you end up just making friends with everyone there to begin with. You can go to any of anyone who's ever on the fence about attending a battle event can attend alone without worry of anything and you will make a minimum i mean depending on how outgoing you are how much you put yourself out there of course but if you want to go to an event and make new friends you absolutely will you know what i'm saying it's it really is that easy the culture is so like welcoming to everybody everyone's happy to be there and all like excited to be a part of the vibe and whatnot it's such a great scene man it really is Definitely, man. Yeah, I love it so much. But I mean, with yourself, so I the first battle that I ever saw which got me hooked from the get go was O'Shea versus Lego, which is one of the first don't flop battles. Word, great battle too. Shout out to Lego. He's a that's an old school. I used to love what Lego did with because he was so like on point with his rhyme schemes were so well put together and there was very minimal non-rhyming space in his lines i always fucked with that super heavy definitely yeah it's a it's a shame that he's he's not been about for a long time i think even now he'd go down really well with the uk crowd oh i agree for sure and i think fans would be excited if he or tenshu came back in any capacity people would go crazy for that definitely 
Yeah, man. But for for me personally, I I was only really. It took me a while to go deep enough down the rabbit hole to discover kind of overseas battles. Um, word, word. I kind of stuck purely to don't flop for a while and went back through the jump off stuff and things like that. But okay. the first battle of yours that I ever saw was the two on two where you and Ilmac battled Manic and Spite. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a rather one-sided battle to see for your first one of ours. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I mean, we uh... did, in fairness, we didn't have a lot of close two-on-twos to begin with, but that was one of the mo- – that might have been the most one-sided one that we ever had. Yeah, agreed. And uh, it, it was certainly a good introduction to yourself and Ilmac at that point anyway. But, like, obviously I, I had to then – kind of go back through your your previous battles and that was what led me to discovering like grind time and scribble jams and all that kind of stuff yeah, man but the golden era man the golden era 100 percent. and like for yourself how did this how did this journey even start like how did you how did you get yourself on well I, the, um, I think the oldest battle of yours that I've been able to find online at the moment would be the Franco battle. There's an older one on YouTube. Okay. The the the, the, the confirmed oldest battle I have on YouTube is against a guy named El Greco. Um it's like very poor quality black and white footage. My little brother filmed it with his like legitimate VHS tape camcorder that he had um it was at my junior college in my hometown of monterey so it was probably 01 or 02 something like that this was my first organized battle that i was ever in where it was like brackets mcs in brackets and a, a prize of money and like a sure Uh, stage microphone was being given away that was like the first organized battle i ever went and my brother was super hyped on it so he came and filmed everything and that's literally the very first battle of mine that's on youtube is me versus el greco i have it's a bunch of like generic lines you wouldn't get a thumbs up from a hitchhiker type of stuff very i mean for what it was in 0102 it was probably pretty crazy but in hindsight it's like you know, as basic as it got, but that was my first real organized battle. Um, I started freestyling and actually rapping my junior year of high school. So probably when I was like 16, 17, um, had a couple of friends in high school, one in particular who I rapped with basically every day. And then there was a group of guys who were the grade ahead of us who were like considered better rappers. And all these guys are like still really close friends of mine to this day. And when I got out of high school, um, there was like a weekly, I guess, not really event, but a weekly thing, a weekly function that would happen in my hometown called Freestyle Friday. And it was just the dudes who were a grade ahead of me, some dudes older than them from the area as well, who people who I had never met or heard of before or anything like that. And all these guys would just meet up every Friday at a place called the Maritime Hall in my hometown, which was just a little outdoor area. We could just meet up, gather, and people would either bring a boom box with like a cassette tape of instrumentals, or they would just beatbox. It was called Freestyle Friday. It happened every week, and it was literally just four or five hours of ciphering and weed smoking, and it was the coolest shit that I had ever seen, and I was like, eventually I'm going to be good enough to finally partake in this thing. So I pretty much like stayed low key i would rap like to people in my high school class and whatnot and uh stayed home practiced freestyling over instrumentals until i felt that i was good enough to jump in and start rapping with these dudes from freestyle friday who i just had like looked up to for a good year solid one dude in particular whose name was is invincible steve and steve still to this day is like one of my best friends one of the i would say he's one of the most like he's probably one of the top three people who are most responsible for me being where I am today. And uh, 
<clears throat> eventually I just sacked up and decided to jump in the cypher like right after Invincible Steve had just spit some incredible insane freestyle. So I spit just like a couple of lines playing off some shit that he said and I could tell that people were sort of reacting and I just the the switch clicked, I got in the zone, I like completely shut the cypher down. Next thing you know, I'm like becoming friends with all these dudes who I had just spent the last year and a half or so like looking up to and studying their styles type of shit. Because this is all uh, this is also pre YouTube. This is like the year 2000, 2001. So even fo- finding battle rap footage wasn't even necessarily a thing. But once I started talking to Steve and he was like, "Yo, you need to be doing this more and you need to be taking it more seriously." Uh, like keep coming back and keep killing it. So I did. And then a couple weeks later, he was just like, yo, we need to start getting you into some battles. And this is still again, Oh one or something. So, I mean, rap battles weren't, it wasn't an easy thing for me to have access to. I was from a very small town in California still had all, I had heard of scribble jam, but it wasn't something that was accessible to me as it was across the country. But there was like, one or two battles a year that took place in San Francisco, one or two battles a year that took place in Los Angeles. I had a car, figured I could at least, I, I, yeah, I should start putting myself out there and making the trip. So I started entering basically anything I could find. And then, um, and then I guess the so called eight mile boom for battle rap happened, where once eight mile dropped, now every little town that even has anything resembling a hip-hop scene is now throwing battle rap events and the bigger cities that were already throwing events are now throwing them for significant money and then i started realizing like oh okay this is like something i can not not only do but something i can turn into like a a side hustle or a part-time job as well And that was basically my introduction to actual battle rapping was just jumping in local like freestyle tournament battles. I think uh, the second one I did. So I did that one at uh, my college and then more stuff started popping up like just around my area stuff that was in a one and two hour drive for me. So like shortly after the one at my college, there was one in a, a town called Santa Cruz, which was about an hour away from where I grew up went up there it was a tournament series called battle av and that was where i met Bo rat tantrum disaster and me and diz both ended up uh losing to the same kid we basically both got jerked there was some there was a kid there named jay jack who looked like he was nine years old but okay. we found out later on that he wasn't it was some sort of uh uh, similar, similar to like Andy Milanakis situation where he okay. just l- looks very young for his actual age type of thing. And, uh, but anyways, we, none of us, no one in the audience knew this at the time. So the kid looked like he was nine years old and he's spitting these crazy freestyles. So yeah, of course he's going to beat me and Diz. And then it wasn't until later that we found out that, uh, he was actually like 18 or 19 or whatever, which is completely besides the point. But that was when, Diz and I first met, Tantrum and I first met, Bo Rat and I first met, and uh, Diz was still the exact same maniac as he ever was. Tantrum rapped the same technical style that everybody saw him have through years of like the grind time era as well. And uh, Bo Rat, who um, m- m- people might not be as familiar with because he didn't do any written battles, but he was definitely like a West Coast freestyle OG. He won a couple of really major freestyle events on the West. And he and I had some classic like scribble jam battles as well. And uh, so, yeah, that was basically like my introduction to the scene and how the doors basically started to open for us. So, a, a lot of it, I mean, I can't lie and say that like Eight Mile had nothing to do with it, despite it's like, I wouldn't say that it influenced me in how I rap in any way, but. I'm aware of the doors that it opened because now, I mean, venues just started looking at it as like, oh, this is something we can make money off of now. Like, you know, clubs that were throwing shows and whatnot. It just became another money-making venture for people to make. And, you know, in a a capitalist society, people were jumping all over that. Everybody wanted to make a quick buck. And at the same time as the business owners want to make a quick buck, 
so do the people who think they can rap and think they can win these things. So it created big enough talent pools for us to have consistent uh, tournament style events and whatnot. And yeah, I mean, I guess the rest is history from there. I pretty much figured out how to dominate the tournament style circuit because I feel like I was just seeing things differently than the rest of the field was, so to speak. And uh, I don't know, I I was able to maybe strategize better than others or just... I, I, I looked at it in a different way. I mean, I knew competitively I could hang with or beat anybody that I was going to be battling. And I, I was never worried about level of competition, but there is also a strategy involved when it comes to, uh, like, you should be paying attention to who's battling before and after you in a tournament. So you have an idea, at least a 50-50 idea of who you're going to be battling in the following rounds. And then the later the rounds get into the event, the tougher your opponent is going to be. So the more quality you want to have, and if you're able to telegraph who your opponent's going to be in your next battle, then you can sort of start planning ahead. I was a pool player like in high school, in my early years of high school. So I guess I, the analogy I would make is that I was sort of looking at it like three shots ahead, like a good pool player would be, like a nine ball player or something like that. Whereas... I wasn't necessarily 100% focused on the ball that I was shooting to try to get in the pocket at that particular time. I was thinking about that ball while at the same time what, how I was going to line up my next three shots in the tournament, basically. Right. No, that makes sense. And it's, I mean, it sounds exhausting in that sense. Yeah, like but at the to, time, yeah. it was too fun to be consumed. Like, it didn't, even, it, it didn't feel like work. Battling has rarely felt like work for me. I mean, b- battling never felt like work for me until uh, writing became an element in battle rap. But freestyling w- was always just like a second nature thing for me and roasting with my friends and whatnot and rebuttaling. Like that shit has always just been so automatic for me that I was like too happy that I could consider it a job to really take the time to actually consider it a job it's funny like i was making an income that was worthy of like a part-time job even during the freestyle tournament eras i was making like a part-time livable wage basically and but i didn't consider it work i was like laughing at the idea of like oh shit like i get to go to work and rap you know what i'm saying it was such a fun like i wasn't jaded to it i wasn't uh i wasn't being like my my drive wasn't the money at the time so i think that's why i wasn't jaded to it and i didn't look at it like it was a job because i was having so much fun i was meeting new people i was networking and i was like creating good opportunities for myself so i mean it was a like i guess at the end of the day it was probably a little bit draining but i never even felt drained because i was so like happy to be a part of something that uh i could be my own boss in I was making my own waves and sort of like uh, in control of, uh, I guess, my own destiny more than a lot of the people I knew who were like going to school and, and, and working for someone who made them miserable type of stuff. I never took it for granted. So I guess it just never felt tiring or like work to me. It's amazing, man. And it's it's been amazing to see even having to kind of go back and, and go through the old eras at a later date, which if I'm honest, I think, I think a lot of people are in the same boat as me in the UK where we, we missed obviously the grind time eras and things like sure. that. And it's, it, and as it's much as I'll back and reminisce for sure. That was such a fun time. Like you can tell too, you can see it translates on camera that everybody was having more fun back then because it was such a new and fresh thing. Like the idea of, I remember when, when dumb versus tantrum, like went viral, so to speak from grind time. And that was such a like fascinating thing for all of us because we had all come up in this like pre YouTube era of where footage was this like rare archived thing that you had to wait for. And now it was just instantly accessible at our fingertips. And not only that, but people were watching it by the, tens of thousands already we were so blown away like all of us felt like little kids about it we didn't know like we we i wish we would have had a better understanding at the time of like what 
we were actually building and what the YouTube platform was providing at the time. Because of course we were all like the majority of us were like naive kids. So we didn't realize that it was the, the like powerhouse platform that it is. You know what I'm saying? I think the first battler that really realized and took advantage of it was dumbfounded. As soon as him and tantrum went viral, he started his own channel and started cranking out content constantly that he was then creating his own like revenue from and uh, expanding the shit out of his brand entirely on his own. And uh, it, it was up like before that, I don't think any of us really realized the, the global reach we had and in turn, like what that meant for our value moving forward. We were all just kind of like, yo, this is fucking crazy. These people who like we've listened to for years are watching us on YouTube. Um, yeah. I mean, just the whole, the whole rush of it was incredible. The that's I definitely consider like the grind time era to be like the golden era, the the inception of grind time, as well as like the inception of KOTD and Don't Flop, because the beginning of all of those eras, like there was just a different feel in the atmosphere, a different level of hunger from all of the MCs. There was no jadedness. There was no um, like so there was no artist who was solely driven by money because we weren't even making money at that point it was just about providing the good content so that hopefully we can make something from this like at a point you know and uh yeah i, I definitely missed that era i actually i got interviewed yesterday by quest mccody on his podcast and real deal had a question that was like what would be your favorite era and he had three different time windows and it was like oh four to oh eight 0708 or like 04 to late 0708 scribble jam era 08 to like 2012 grind time kotd and don't flop inception era and then everything from then until today's date and i basically said the the middle one is for sure my favorite era because nobody was jaded we were having the most fun um people were still being original because it was still a new thing it wasn't just like copy cut and paste a, a particular formula so much as it is today type of deal and uh yeah man I, I i absolutely miss that era it's good to go back and reminisce on uh the old gt stuff the old don't flop stuff the original kotd battles there's definitely like a different uh energy in the in like uh, in the crowd atmosphere it's crazy oh definitely and i mean it was so it was a, around 2009, maybe late 2008, that I got into battle rap personally. And it's there's often an argument in the UK of, or not an argument as such, but everybody aspires to get the scene back to how it was for Don't Flop in, say, 2012 to 2014. And... It, it really is as simple enough to say as we will never get that back. Like it was, it was just the excitement of battle rap being new to a, a fairly mainstream audience that made that what it was. And I think, especially for the UK scene, I think we, we've not had a, a real standout star for a long time that, it's not going to attract new fans in, in my opinion. And I mean, the UK scene is very kind of inclusive anyway, recently. Like it's, it's a difficult scene to follow over the yeah, last Yeah, it's super, it's really interesting to me. And you have like right now there's sort of a re or a surge taking place. The Irish scene is now starting to explode. And the Irish scene now reminds me of sort of like how it felt uh, with the early don't flop events and whatnot where uh, I mean I've only I've done two events for the Irish League rap is full now over the last uh, two I did one, I battled O'Shea two years ago out there I was supposed to go back last year and couldn't make it and then I just recently battled the Irish battler nugget this past February out there and both events that I did out there it had a very similar feel to like the OG don't flop events um, where just the crowd energy is absolutely buzzing. Like the crowd is happy to see everybody. Nobody's talk. Uh, it's not like a talk fest through the battles in the audience and shit. People are paying attention and reacting to the material. All the battlers are excited because of how good the energy is. 
Um, it's definitely it it has like a similar feel to uh, like the the OG UK days, and I I feel like he like it's it's like been kind of hit or miss out there the last several UK events that I've seen. I feel like Shoddy was doing a great job with Premier, and and those crowds were uh, were showing up. And and you could really like feel their presence even on the footage, which is a great thing. Um, but I don't know what's gone on. Something out there has made uh, the the scene, I, I guess, a bit more stagnant, especially than it's been in like you know more recent years. It's like the last year and a half out there, it's been very stagnant, with the exception of like the the handful of premier events that have happened. Um, it's a shame because there's such a deep talent pool out there. And clearly there's still a want and a need for like a, a healthy, cohesive scene out there. It just still seems like there's there's clearly still a divide between a couple different people for whatever reason. And that can make it harder for people to get behind any one like league or brand as a whole because it's so small out there already like there's really no reason to divide it three and four ways you know definitely no i completely agree in that i agree on the the, in the sense of rap as well as well like the my the the way that i view battle rap right now has changed a lot to what it was a few years ago and the leagues that i'm following the most right now is rap is full is one of them i battle is probably the league for me right now for sure Um, i love what lex is doing shout out to lex he's uh he's got a great vision he is (coughs) such a good um good dude running a league he he cares about his battlers and not only their well-being but the well-being of their brand and 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 them being successful moving forward. He he genuinely cares. You can tell, and that's Definitely. a great fucking quality to have someone like that behind you. You know, and he also knows as much or more about this battleship than the majority of the people involved in the scene. He knows what to look for. He knows what other people are looking for. He knows what to listen for and what others are listening for. Um. It's it's dope for him too that let URL brought him on as like a scout because he's uh he's gonna bring some talent over there that are gonna be people who they generally probably would have overlooked had it not been for him because he has a bit more of let's say an eclectic taste than like your your typical URL scout would you know what I'm saying he's uh he's not looking for like the the same old cookie cutter rappers he's looking for people who stand out because of their uniqueness and that's great to have it's dope that he's like built his own platform on the strength of that and is also helping those same dudes get onto bigger platforms too 100 percent, man and like for me personally url is probably the league that i follow the least there's there's a lot of battlers on the kind of strictly url roster that Personally, I just do not enjoy battle, battle watching because I don't feel like it's battle rap anymore. Um, yeah, and there's very few of the like of the URL battles that I like make a point to to watch. I'll watch anything with twerk in it because I think the guy is phenomenal. Yeah, He's definitely like a, a rare talent. It's something we pretty much have never seen. I've seen a lot of shit in battle rap. A lot. I've seen just about everything in battle rap. I still haven't seen him live. But the energy that even he, that he translates even through the camera, I've never seen anything like it. It's fucking crazy. So I Agreed. watch anything he drops, anything Nitty drops, because he is probably my favorite writer on their platform. Um, if Hollow does anything over there, I'll peep it. Anything Pat's Day does for sure, because Pat's my dude. Um, but, I mean... A good, I would say on average nine out of ten of their releases. I'm just not. I'm, I'm first of all, I'm not trying to watch almost any 45 plus minute battle. Period. Let alone then whether or not it's like one of my homies that I'm I'm going to, but I'm probably just gonna watch their rounds or some shit. <laughs> like it's you know, like it's it's a commitment 
it's uh, that's the one direction they've moved in that I don't think is is good. But I, I mean, who the fuck am I to say about any move that they made? They're they're obviously the number one league. They're the, the the leading franchise of battle rap. Like, there's no disputing that. They're absolutely crushing it, and they continue to like push the boundaries, open new doors, which hopefully, I mean, the, the real hope is that this is beneficial for everybody. The doors that they're kicking open are going to eventually benefit everyone who's involved. That would be the dopest end game from it. But I mean, overall, I feel like the majority of the, of the content that they put out, it's most of the same, most dudes trying to sound like the same six people to begin with. And, uh, I don't know. There's only a handful of like real standout originals on there that I like go out of my way to peep. I'll peep Emerson Kennedy for sure. If he drops anything on there, I think he's super unique and dope. Jay yeah. Nightwear, they actually battled each other like, I mean, I guess semi recently. I know the battle just dropped on the app pretty recently. And that is a very fire URL battle. And those are like two dudes who are doing their own thing in a, they, they have their own sound. And uh, you, you can tell they're clearly not trying to be anybody else which is a big thing that i look for these days where the majority especially of newer additions are just so watered down agreed and i get a lot of stick for this but one of the things that url have done recently that excites me the most Mm -hmm. is this tournament that they're putting together and the fact that jay the nightwing versus real sick is happening is Real seek, yeah, bro. Yeah, I feel like I was talking to Lex about that semi recently. I feel like, uh, I like, obviously anything can happen, especially in a tournament with that many people. But to me, the winner of that battle has a good chance of representing that side of the bracket in the finals. I, I said the exact same. Like it just to me, if you because for either one of them, that's gonna be the toughest person either one of them will see on their path to the final. So it'll really just come down to obviously how seriously they'll take the following matchups. But yeah, that, I mean, it's almost a shame that that battle has to be that early in the tourney. You know, it's yeah. like it's because those are two of two of the names that a lot of people think could win it outright. And it's just, well, right, right off top, you're, you're eliminating 50 percent of the potential like, you know. Fucking like they they would have been if I had to pick like four people who I thought would would win it they would probably be the first two I would name. Yeah, agreed. That's going to be incredible to see. But yeah, I mean, as well as I battle and rap is full. Like I I, I really love what's happening over in Vancouver with the King of the Dot agreed. scene there. I love Sp- Sparko's my my guy, man. He's uh, there. There's uh, with the. Uh, like the the crowd vibe and everything i'm big on that these days like crowd energy and just going somewhere where where the scene doesn't feel stagnant and where everything is still well received and i mean it's been a while since i battled in toronto to be honest but my last handful of battles in vancouver have been the most fun i've had battling in canada uh period over like probably the last five or six years or something and i still have endless love for toronto i have so many good friends up there who are, who i've made and people i like consider family now but the crowd the battle crowd up there started to get a little spoiled yeah all of the dope shit and then for some reason it's weird because usually when you're getting all of the dope shit you're gonna stay the most in tune but it almost seemed there was like complacency from the crowd and people were just like showing up at the events just for the social function and to like drink and talk to their homies. It was weird because Toronto had such a thriving scene. And I think that it could go back to that. I think uh, maybe that's been why they've held off throwing something there for the past couple of years is to like sort of rebuild that desire for their scene to want to have the matchups that Gannick was giving them, you know what I'm saying? He was giving them to them because that's his fucking city. I, you know, he, he wants to put on for his city and he should, and they should have been more receptive to like a large amount of what he was trying to put on for them. Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, the, the crowd there became a little stagnant for a while, but Vancouver 
is Vancouver to me. It reminds me of like any standard West Coast like Cali crowd. The crowds, it's very diverse. They they just want to show up and hear good material. They don't care what style it is or who's saying it. They're going to respond if it's good, and they're going to show you a ton of love for coming through to their city regardless. And that, as a performer, is what you want every single place you go. Like, you never want to go somewhere where it's supposed to be a thriving scene and, like, receive crickets and then realize that that's just the like how the event energy is you know what i'm saying it's fucking vancouver is is very live and and i i hope that like i mean given once things get back to like a more normal way of life i hope that they consider uh like giving vancouver a major event this year well i know they were going to do blackout in la this year but maybe a world dom vancouver or Gannick versus Gully in Vancouver, or some, one of their staple events, maybe, throwing it in Vancouver, just to see what they could do. Because Vancouver has no problem like selling out 300 tickets in a smaller venue, for sure. They can do that every single time in their sleep. Yeah. But um, what hasn't been proven yet in Vancouver is whether or not they could sell 800 to 1,000 tickets like uh, like how Blackout 5 was or something. You know what I'm saying? It's possible that they could. Um, I, I think that if they worked hard enough, they absolutely could, and they could attract enough people from like other areas to come over if the event's good enough, you know what I'm saying? But that is the one thing that has yet to be proven up there. So why not, when things get back to a little more sense of normal, Give, give them a shot to see if maybe they can have a successful major. Definitely. And I had Le Sparker on the show a couple of weeks back, and it's oh, definitely in the pipeline. Oh, sick. Super good to hear. I love Spark, man. That dude is uh, just all love and positivity and caring about everybody else's well being. And that is so few and far between in today's day and age of fucking sociopaths that I appreciate Sparka <laughs> so much as a person. I can imagine, man. Just just having spent you know, around about two hours chatting with him in the end, it was it was incredible. One of my one of my favorite episodes so far. Oh yeah, sure. he's such he's a super interesting dude. And he's a lot older than the like the majority of the scene. He's super young at heart. So you wouldn't if, I mean if he never told you his age, you would never in a million years guess. I always thought he and I were the same age, but he has several years on me too. But the guy has so many stories and has been through so many like different walks of life. It's fucking crazy. Like the people he knows out there and has worked with out there because of his, like not only because of his business, but just like being a, a staple in the Vancouver scene type of shit. Sparka has, has seen some shit. He is a super interesting dude. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, man. And like the reason for me that, that I follow these leagues closer than any others is more like the atmosphere that comes off on camera. It, they're just, they're more of a, they're more of a party with battles happening than they are just your standard battle event, event yeah, like most people are Agreed. doing. Agreed. And it's, it's amazing to see, it's man. It's such but... a good atmosphere. Everybody's happy to see each other, and it's all hugs. and Oh, it's so good, man. Definitely. But with, with yourself, so again, this is where we start to get into the difficult questions, I'm afraid. But No worries. I can appreciate that there's going to be a couple of different answers to this, but for yourself, what is your personal favorite battles that you've been a part of so far? My, uh, like just atmosphere wise or just in battle in general. So just the ones that you'll, you'll kind of never forget. Cause I mean, there's, there must have been over a hundred battles for you by now. So, oh, which well, ones really I have 160 stand out? something just on Verse Tracker, and then probably another 150 that have never seen YouTube. <laughs> I've crazy. done a lot of fucking battles. There, I would say, as far as like most memorable ones that stand out, uh, me versus Nestle. In uh, that was act. That was like uh, that was an I battle battle as well. 
that was the, the original I battle back in Connecticut. And the atmosphere for that was insane. It felt like it brought us back to like how the inception of grind time felt it had a very golden era feel to it. And like battling someone like Ness, who I have infinite fucking respect for is, uh, I knew it was going to bring the best out of me. I know it's someone who I can't slack on for uh, like a sentence, let alone a round if I want to have a chance, you know what I'm saying? So, the most slept on ever, right? Yeah. Oh, I think so. He's so, Ness is so fucking talented. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, like not even just as a rapper or just as a battle rapper. Ness can do so many things musically at like a, recording artist level like a, a high selling recording artist level it is unbelievable the talent that he has and uh yeah i would say the atmosphere for that battle one of the craziest i've ever experienced um dumbfounded that was like the og on some og battle of the bay shit but the atmosphere for that too was was one that stands out especially because that was like, right after Dumb had just battled Tantrum and, I believe, PH. So I think he, be he beat someone else after Tantrum. And then they were like, all right, well, you got to battle him. And, you like, basically, you got to beat him or no one will. So it was, like, one of those things where I just kind of took it upon myself to uh, <laughs> to put a stop to the insanity or, or do what I could. Um, so that one stands out. The events we did in Sweden for uh, a dude named Chubbs who threw these events out there a couple times. I went out there twice and the events were basically, it was, it was Amer all American. He brought out a load of like top tier American battlers to battle uh, a handful of like Swedish MCs and maybe one or two British MCs as well. So that he could get some battle fans over from the UK. Um, but it was a card that would essentially be like, a battle between an American battler and a Swedish battler, and then a main stage American like performing act would go on after that. So it'd be like Bone Thugs does a 30 minute live set, and then Disaster battles so and so from Sweden. Then Paul Wall does a 30 minute live set, and then Ilmak and Thesaurus battle Henry Bowers and O'Shea, and then fucking. Yuck Mouth from the Loonies does a live set. And that shit was so crazy to me. And the dude who booked it, the way he treated it was like, well, you guys are all my artists for the weekend. So, like, you guys are all being treated as equals, which was fucking awesome. So there was no, like, industry to battle or hierarchy or anything like that. We were all just staying in the same hotel. We all had the same VIP area with, like, a sushi room a fucking steak room, a chicken wing room. Oh, it was absolutely insane. So that stands out to me just for being the, like, over-the-top production that it was. It was so fucking nuts, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fuck, like I said, I've literally, I've done hundreds of battles. So there's just, there's so many. A lot of the international stuff stands out to me just because, uh, I mean, getting to, being able to do something that I love to do as much as battling and having that take me all over the world, I always tried to soak up the the travel destination as much as I could wherever it was. I mean, Australia, like, I got to tour Australia with my album with my boy Chase Moore, and we, like, booked a couple of battles down there in the process. That was one of the dopest experiences I've ever had. Um, fuck, I mean, I've done shows at, like, a 4,000 year old amphitheater on an island in Greece <laughs> it's, the, the, the list goes up there's so many different things it's really hard to narrow down I can imagine man and it's it's it really has just been an incredible journey and like with the the Sweden event that you mentioned like I, I actually lived there for a couple of years and sure. I can imagine that the fan base was just so grateful to see everything happening oh, as well so happy yeah they, everybody was so friendly and appreciative and just like 
but you guys are here. Like it, it was something you could tell that, especially Swedish battle fans, a lot of them thought they would never see. Like even yeah. all the base mentality guys were just like, yo, this is wild to us having all of you guys out here. And base mentality was a league that was run in Sweden. Um, I think that was like Mills and Henry's home league for a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like they were just, I mean, mo- mostly just appreciative that we, you know, made the trip out to, uh, especially to help put on like some of the Swedish talent. Cause that was basically the whole concept of the event. And I think that had something to do with how, the guy who booked it was able to get these like massive grants to fund the event. I think part of the stipulation was, okay, well, like we'll give you X amount of Euro to book the event. You just have to have whatever percentage of the talent be Swedish. So the dude who booked it figured out the most effective way to do that would be to just book a bunch of Swedish battlers and then he can book all of these like main stage performing acts to headline the event. It was fucking insane, man. So, yeah. It's like I was on stage for Anti Up by MOP, which is one of the most like lit songs of all time to begin with. And I'm on stage for a live performance of it and then go from that into battling uh, some Danish dude. <laughs> like, it's so <laughs> wild to me. So, and, like, all of the artists who were on the card, they all showed us hella love, too. Like, a lot of them were like, yo, I've never, like, sat, and, or I've never, like, stood and watched a live organized battle in person. All of them were like, yo, we've seen you on YouTube. We know what you can do. But that was crazy, seeing it live. Like, I remember, <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is a real sentence that happened that I was about to say. So I was having breakfast at this buffet in Sweden with Paul Wall. And he, he was telling me, he was like so blown away by it. He's like, yo, like I've watched thousands of battles on YouTube, but I've never seen an organized battle in person until last night. And it made me an even bigger fan and appreciator of what y'all do. He was like, that was fucking crazy. And I'm just like, how is this even real life? How am I having breakfast with Paul Wall? And he's talking to me about this to begin with. But it was hella dope, like super humbling to see that uh, even these guys who fucking tour the world and who rock for like arena size uh, settings and shit still like appreciated our craft and understood the difference between seeing it live and online. I thought that was dope as fuck. Oh, definitely, man. Yeah, it's a... It's an amazing experience. I got to speak to O'Shea about it too, and uh, like, yeah, that we had so much fun in that battle. Yeah, yeah. And, and in that battle, yo, we're <laughs> so it's me and El are battling O'Shea and Henry Bowers, and then there's like the host, the co-host, and then Crooked Eye and Yuck Mouth are just standing there in the the host shot of the like they're just spectators in our battle, and then on the stage is like. Mr. Fab, Jacka, rest in peace, and like a couple other of the main stage acts. So these people were just all like huddled around watching our battle. It's so crazy to me. It's amazing, man. Yeah, and like O'Shea was saying how he he had no idea what he was expecting this, at this event because he was booked very last minute. Yeah. Um, and Same he, here. I had no idea what to expect either. I was I had never been to Sweden to begin with. I had no idea what to expect. I, I mean, my, my like general perceptions was that there were, like it was a much more reserved culture. So I was super curious to see like how a live event was going to look, you know? And uh, yeah, I feel like our two on two was actually like maybe the last battle booked on that card. And, that would make uh, sense. Yeah. I remember having just like super, I, I, I couldn't have expectations because I had never, experienced anything like it you know there was i didn't have some like a sample to base it off of really because it wasn't going to be like any other battle event i'd ever been the fucking mop was headlining like what (laughs) i've never had that happen i've headlined plenty of battle events there was never artists at that magnitude that were like sharing the stage with us so that alone we were like what the fuck is going on here and then we got out there and it was legit just like endless vip treatment just here's a bag of weed for you guys here's fucking 
he, he, like we'll go to we go to the venue and then we had a, an entire lower floor like an underground floor of the venue which was basically the vip area for the artists and just each room was filled with a different amenity for us we had like a giant room just filled with booze and we had two other rooms that were just filled with food it was so crazy i was like like i remember saying multiple times being like oh wow we're like real rappers for the weekend you know what i'm saying like no (laughs) i mean not to short sell what we do in the battle rap world and in this back in the states and in north america or anywhere else but definitely we we didn't have like i've I've never been to an american or, or an event in north america just a battle rap event where i mean i've been to one where we've had a vip room but not one where we had like our own sushi room, our own alcohol room, our own chicken wing room, and our own beef cut room. That was just bizarre to me. I was like, oh shit, this is like something you would expect in a rider contract for like somebody who is a multi-platinum artist. It was fucking ill. <laughs> Can imagine, man. It sounds crazy. And like, O'Shea was saying he, he didn't know what to expect. He'd spent 18 hours flying there. Yeah. And his phone died halfway and he kind of got out of the train station and it was Malmo, right? The the city. Yep, Malmo. In. We flew um, into Copenhagen and then take the train from Copenhagen to Malmo. Yeah, that's right. And uh he said he got out of the train station, he didn't have a phone, didn't have anyone's number to get in touch with them or anything. And then all of a sudden he turns around and just sees MOP walking out of the station and gets a taxi with them. And I was like, what? Like, MOP is in MOP. And yeah, couldn't believe it. It was unbelievable, man. Yeah, amazing. And like, having lived in Sweden for a long time, I know they don't get opportunities to see things like that very often at all. So, word, word. You can imagine you know, that the... people were freaking out. I remember we were just in the amount of time like from going to the airport to train station and then from Copenhagen to Malmo, Arsenal must have gotten stopped by a dozen fans. Like (laughs) probably at least a dozen fans. He just had to stop to take pictures at every stop of the, like we got off the plane and we're going to baggage claim. He takes a photo in baggage claim and I'm just like, Oh, that's super dope. Like tell them to come through. You know what I'm saying? Then we go to like the train station in Copenhagen. He needs like three more fans there. Then we take the train from Copenhagen to Malmo, get off in Malmo, and like a group of five people run to him to get a photo while we're like walking the opposite direction. It was fuck I it was wild. Like did not expect it whatsoever. And I'm just going, Oh shit, the rebel's a fucking superstar, man. Oh, it's so crazy. Cool, as a man, it's it's amazing, and yeah, I'm, I'm gutted I missed it to be honest, because it was it was around the time that I was living there you as well. Like so. And oh, you were living there, and you were into into the scene too at that point. Yeah, unfortunately, I lived really far up north in Sweden, so right. getting to Malmo was it was about a twenty hour drive. Oh, wow. um, holy shit! I didn't even realize that uh, there was that much ground to cover in Sweden. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's bigger than a lot of people. Even though there's not a lot there, like, yeah. I mean, it's a it, well, probably about an eighteen-hour drive, I'd say okay. actually. But you probably pass about eight cities on that journey, so it's uh, it's it's proper dense and spread out in that sense. But wow, I wasn't that's... even aware that the event was happening. I okay. kind of yeah, it wasn't. It definitely. It was really, I mean, the way that the guy was promoting it, like all of the battlers on the card were promoting it individually, but I would, there wasn't necessarily a battle scene there promoting it. Like the guy who booked it was promoting it as an event that he booked. And obviously his big ticket selling point is the industry artists. So it wasn't being like pushed as a battle rap event like even when it was announced out there because even like the main poster and everything it was like mop was on the poster 
and it was a list of all the main stage performing acts. And that makes perfect sense because that's how you're going to sell the tickets at the cost that you're asking. Um, and that's how, you, you know, you, you have to move them with the most recognizable faces and artists, obviously. So I think that's why it wasn't really being pushed as a battle event per se, you know, that had, that's, that's probably why any, like a lot of battle fans in the area didn't actually know about it unless they were told either by following one of the American battlers posting about it or knowing like one of the Swedes or one of the UK guys on the card. Really. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. But like with yourself, then is there, is there a battle that you'd say is your, your least favorite that you've been a part of over the years? Is there any that you're, you, you can't watch back or that you're not a fan of? Um, yeah, there's a there's I've, there's probably a few I haven't even watched back to be honest. Um, one that stands out, and I don't even think I necessarily did particularly like terribly, but it's just a battle that I knew that I lost in the in the building, and that's pretty much why I never watched it back. Was me versus Cortez, uh, Grind Time New York, and it wasn't even necessarily that. I I'm, I was particularly like bad or he was particularly good. It was really just, it was the same night and event where Disaster and Sway had battled. And that battle was literally right before me versus Cortez. And at that time, Diz was sort of already seen as like New York public enemy number one. And then he has that amazing battle with Swave where he like freestyles in the middle and destroys the heckler had a couple other absolutely fucking ridiculous lines and like rebuttals and shit in the battle basically disaster goes over there and wins over the new york crowd and then i'm supposed to battle the guy from brooklyn in brooklyn right after that just happened <laughs> and i knew i was just like oh well these guys are just there's i was like after diz just did what he did there is no way they're gonna give me an inch to breathe in this thing like they're they're gonna want their guy to beat me as decisively as they can make it seem type of shit you know what i'm saying and that's pretty much what it was you know <laughs> like i remember even before i start rapping i'm like about to spit like whatever my first bar is and i'm like hold it down and then someone's like, don't say nothing that's going to get you jumped. <laughs> and I just like started laughing. I was just like, <laughs> shut <laughs> up, whore, like fucking corn dog. First of all, who says something like that? But, oh man, it was, it was definitely a moment where I knew uh, the atmosphere and the moments that led up to the battle were going to play a role in the outcome of it. So I would say that, probably stands out as like the one uh like that's i guess that's that one stood out for a while as just a situation that i wasn't i knew that it was going to be an uphill battle for me the entire battle and i didn't do anything to make it easier on myself and i feel like i probably kind of slacked a little on preparation as well and uh I don't know. It was like the end of the grind time era. It definitely wasn't one of my like favorite performances or favorite rounds of material. I might have watched it once initially when it came out and thought like, oh, it's not as bad as I expected. But I think that one stands out. Another one semi recently, um, and I've watched it back and it actually wasn't as bad as I thought. Um, but when I battled Ronnie. That was, I mean, I, I feel I felt in the moment like my performance was bad, and uh, I think that probably has to do with why I've like only watched it back once or twice since then. But basically, the only reason that I even feel like, and I hate to even make excuses, but so I did the the battle in Ireland like two weeks before the Ronnie battle, then I got back from Ireland a few days after. Um, the event happened. I wanted to stay out in Dublin for like another two days and chill. So when I get back, I like recover from my jet lag and I'm like, all right, time to start like preparing for the Ronnie battle now tonight. Cause usually I take like the week of the event to write for whatever the battle is. And, 
I ended up winning a, a live poker tournament at the Rio for like a little under 15k and that was like five days before the battle and that was supposed to be the night that I was going to start working on it but once I won the tournament I essentially like kind of mentally checked out of the battle to be honest I was just like fuck like I just won 15k I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not gonna get anywhere near that to for this battle <laughs> um and I still though I like I feel bad for uh for having that happen but i mean i just like i partied for almost like two days straight after winning just with a, a couple of friends and whatnot and then still fully intended on like getting the work done and i did i like wrote around a day the th like the three days before like leading into the battle and whatnot and i felt good about the material going into it and like i had run my rounds clean before the event felt like it was going to go over well and then at the event, it was an event that happened in my hometown. So for that reason alone, I wanted to not slack, regardless of winning the tournament and, ha and giving myself like limited prep time. I still wanted to give a good performance because it was my hometown. So obviously like the majority of the people not only are there to see me, but I know them personally. And I don't want to let these people down, of course. And then I'm like, Lightly going over my material in my head. The battle before ours is happening, which was QP versus Saint. Quantum physics QP versus Saint. And some little, like, skirmish happens at one point of their battle. Water gets poured on somebody's shoes or some shit. And some kind of drama pops off to where, like, it sounded like a fight might happen or something like that. So everybody's paying attention to that myself included because i obviously want to make sure nothing pops off at this venue i want to make sure we still get to battle and everything happens functionally and then the shit gets broken up and then literally like as soon as it ends it's like okay the source and ronnie are up and i was just kind of like whoa like that's a weird energy shift to have to <laughs> transition into and, like, the crowd vibe was a little bit off from it, too, which is, what like, they're kind of quiet. Uh, it's like it was the very end of the, the event. Like, the doors opened for the venue at, like, 2 p.m., and we battled at, like, almost midnight. And uh, I hadn't, because of, like, the shit that was going on with, like, the, the, the drama, the shit talking back and forth or whatever, that usually the battle before mine, I'm outside pacing back and forth, running my rounds, like, whispering them to myself just to make sure i have all of my cues correct and everything like that but i didn't really get an opportunity to do that in this instance because i was so preoccupied with just making sure no drama was going to happen and making sure the event was still going to take place so i didn't really give myself a run through and then just hop right into the battle and lose the coin toss so i have to go first and i know i feel like my first like probably had like a stumble in my first eight or 16 or something like that. And I'm just probably my own worst critic. So that shit stands out to me significantly more than anyone in the audience or anyone watching on YouTube. But that's just like how meticulous I am with preparation. And I would say that I felt disappointed in my performance after, because I remember like knowingly being uncomfortable in the first, because I was like, fuck, I just lost the coin toss and have to go first after this weird ass shift in energy has taken place and i didn't give myself 20 minutes to just run my material three times in my head so i think that's one that stands out in recent memory and cortez probably would be old school one right and yeah i was gonna say the the atmosphere at the the recent event so was that it's not smoked out battles, is it? I, I've forgotten the name now. No, um, it was it was a KOTD event, but it was a, like the league initially that had booked it was Chamber Battles. That's it. My homie Keegan, who's from my hometown and uh, has like always reached out to me and been like, yo, if I ever like throw a final event for my league, the Chamber, like I definitely want you to be a part of it, of course. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like for on some hometown shit, I have to do it. And then... He had, initially he had booked like me, Ronnie. He had the Saint QP battle. He had 
Mad Flex Danny Myers, which was also on it. And you can even see in that battle that the energy is a, a little off too. Um, and then another battle that was supposed to be on the card but ended up not being on it was uh, Reverse Live versus A Ward. And I think that just had to do with like once it became a K. Like that would, so those were like the initial four staples of the card. And it was going to be a chamber event. It was going to be the last, the, the event was called The Last Word. And it was supposed to be Keegan's last event before he was going to announce that he was now taking over Ground Zero West Coast. And then uh, KOTD was basically like, well, yo, why don't you just like make this a KOTD slash GZ event, like GZ for the undercard, but we'll put all the main battles on the KOTD channel. And uh, that's what ended up happening with it. And I think that's why Ward and Reverse ended up falling through, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to like you know speak on anybody else's business or anything, but I think that's what happened. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And the crowd seem a little bit like a little bit slack during quite a few of the battles. I remember watching yeah. Mad Flex, Danny Myers, and just thinking like. Some of this is crazy, and it's... And people weren't... Pro- yeah, for sure. Especially, like, those two... I mean, those are two people who should probably be battling in front of, like, a very educated battle crowd. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Danny... Danny is... Uh, like, his live energy can be enough to win people over, and eventually that's what started happening. Danny's energy was, like, so crazy for the battle, people started fucking with it for sure. And Flex, a lot of people like because he makes shit so he makes shit look and sound so effortless, and like it sounds hella cool, but it has it does have a lot of layers to it, and he is he is very much a writer's writer, and like the untrained ear, a lot of which was probably there that day, is gonna have trouble picking up like a lot of his standout punches on one listen. You know what I'm saying, like. He's definitely the type of dude who you like to go back and rewatch and re-listen to because you're going to catch new shit in Mad Flex versus every single time. And uh, I feel like the the crowd, like we had, there was definitely still some like Bay Area regulars in the crowd and whatnot, and there was a good amount of battlers in the crowd. Um, but yeah, the energy was uh, was definitely a little different towards that. I think that was also just because of how long of a day it was. Like even Danny and and Mad Flex, they didn't battle until like. 10 30 11 at night something like that and we had you know the doors opened at two i got there at like three or something just to make because i wanted to make sure being as it's my hometown that like people are showing up and every everything is all good made sure that like keegan doesn't need anything extra and whatnot and i just want to you know make sure things are going to run smoothly but i was also there for nine hours before i battled Mm. which is a long time for sure definitely no I, I can appreciate that and it's the battles that came out of it are really good though like from what i've seen so far oh, yeah, so. For sure and i feel like, like even when i watched back ronnie and i like i was like oh i was like this is not what i thought it was in the moment at all and i like even told ronnie after that i was like fuck i'm sorry for slipping up man i feel like i was like i feel like a clown for slipping up like that and he's just like bro don't even sweat it and i was like nah i'm like super meticulous and and tough on myself about that shit. And when it's in my hometown, I obviously want it to go perfect. And I don't want it to look close. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Shout out to so, Ronnie. Anyways, he had some uh, some entertaining material. And, uh, yeah. It's still, it, it came out, the footage came out better uh, than I expected as far as my performance. Yeah. But those are definitely two battles that stand out to me. As like when it ended, I was like, "Fuck, I don't even want to watch that back." Like that's how I felt. But that's also just a product of being my own worst critic. No, I can see that. And for me, you know, just watching the battle, I I really enjoyed it. And I've I've got a bit of stick for this in the past. I, I've actually always struggled to get on board with Rani, if I'm honest. But I really enjoyed his stuff in that battle as well. So. He's, uh, he has yeah. a couple of he he was dope against Carter Deans. That's like one of his best performances for sure. He has a couple of battles where he's very fire. 
and then a couple were they're kind of hit or miss for me. But, yeah. Uh, I thought he did well against Madflex too. That's actually a pretty close battle. Yeah, yeah, he did, and uh, he he did okay in the Laugh and Stalk battle, but true. I mean, how do you approach Laugh and Stalk? You it's know, hard. So, let me tell you, it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> Laughing stock is very tough to like. You can't take yourself seriously. You have to know that anything you're saying about him in jest, he's already completely aware of. So it's not going to affect him in any way. You just have to hope that it's like clever enough to where he knows it's funny. That's kind of what I try to do. I was like, well, if I can write something clever enough to get a laugh out of him, I'll be ha- I'm satisfied. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because He's like one of the most hilarious people in the world to me. So if I can get a laugh out of that guy, I'm set. Agreed. Yeah, I've uh, been lucky enough to have him on the show as well, which I really, really enjoy. He's a hilarious guy. I'm a huge fan of his. Such a good dude, too. Yeah. Yeah. And weekly battle feed, man. Like. Oh, that was my favorite shit. I loved weekly battle feed. Me too. I love that so, so much. Golden. I remember when he hit me up about it. He was like so surprised about the hot air balloon battle. And he was like so surprised that I was just like, like him and Avo both were kind of just like, really? It's that easy? And I'm like, yeah, man, are you kidding? Like the hot air balloon battle? We're getting, A, we get to troll Mad Ills. B, we're actually doing this. Like that's a crazy idea. And then C, there, I couldn't think of de- like I could never do a battle like that against an opponent who takes themselves too seriously. It just wouldn't have the same aesthetic, you know what I'm saying? Wait, it has to be against someone who's aware of the moment, uh, like uh, like an LNS, you know. I remember like he was Definitely. just like, like him and Alpha were just like, well, because they just texted me like, yo, is this something you'd be interested? in? I'm like, fuck yeah, I'd do that. <laughs> like that simple as that, you know? And they were just like, well sick word let's figure this out then it was so funny how it just like fell into place so easily the crazy thing is too is that we did like the whole battle we did it on one take despite the crippling fear that was coursing through me i i thought i was gonna have to use like 10 takes to get through my rounds no question i can imagine man and like i was saying to laugh and stalk like I've got a little bit of a fear of heights anyway, and watching him like looking over the side. Over? Of, oh my oh god! My god. It's so uncomfortable, bro. It, it, the look over, <laughs> I couldn't watch him look over. Like once I realized that's what he was doing, I'm like, no, nope, can't do it, can't do. It. Even Kyle, when he was filming, he like after he filmed, he was like, fuck, I like legit thought i was gonna have a panic attack when i first started filming he's like if i wasn't looking into the camera lens at the shot i would have had a full-blown panic attack and i was like bro me too because yo when we got into the cart i like the basket the basket didn't even come up to my waist so that made me feel super uncomfortable like more of my body is exposed outside of the basket than is covered by the the basket that I'm standing in that made me super nervous and there was nothing strapping us inside like you're just standing freely so I was thinking like I could just fucking topple over the side of this thing at any given moment without even like realizing it's gonna happen you know what I'm saying like one misstep so I legit I found like a there was like a small little like loop like a canvas loop strap in the corner of the basket and I felt it was behind me and I gripped onto that thing with my left hand tighter than I have held on to anything in my life. And for the entire battle, I did not let it go. I'm standing so still just trying not to move while we're fucking ascending. Basically it was so, it's such a unique experience. I would say that that battle experience might stand out as like, the most standout be just because of what it was it was fucking terrifying and you still have to execute your material and i i move around a lot when i battle i had to be entirely stationary 
for like my own safety and the good of everybody else in the balloon. <laughs> it was such a wild experience. And like the guy who was fucking uh the the guy who owns the hot air balloon, he's just like calmly in between rounds because basically what he would do, he would get us up to a high enough height to where we could spit a 90 second round without like, you know, coming back to the ground essentially, like while, while still maintaining hot air balloon heights. So we go up like, you know, 1800 feet or something absurd. And he's just, and like right before I'm spitting my first round, he's just like, all right, like we're at 1800 feet. We can go if you guys want. <laughs> I'm just like, why did you have to tell me how high we are? And then, so then rap for 90 seconds straight and then redo the uh, like redo the ascent like we so basically he would get us up to a height to where Avo could film around without him having to use the hot air because the noise would fuck with the footage you know what I'm saying yeah. so then in between every round then we're like reascending up another thousand feet it was so fucking scary bro and did you uh, I wanted to ask that because I was going to say they must drop a few hundred feet at least in between rounds. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, he said, he was like, yeah, you just dropped like 600 feet. That's crazy. Do, do you feel that? Not really while you're rapping, but while you're not, you notice it because you're just like, oh yeah, we're de-. You know, like, when I'm rapping, all I'm thinking is get through the material. But when LNS is rapping, I'm like partially listening and partially kind of like soaking in what's around me, like, oh shit, we're we're still well over a thousand feet above the ground right now. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah, the guy was basically saying like he would take us up to between eighteen hundred and two thousand feet, and then in ninety seconds we would drop roughly five to six hundred, and then he would just take us back up again. Fucking <laughs> crazy, it was man. Wild. Oh, such an experience. It was super fun. Shout out to Avo and shout out to Laughingstock. It was, I'd say it's the most unique battle experience I've ever had in my life. Oh, 100%. And Laughingstock was saying that they they actually booked it through Groupon as like a Valentine's Day special. And you got, you got loads of like champagne and stuff too. And I can imagine there's no one you'd rather spend the Valentine's Day Oh, yeah, right when we got off, day. like, right when, when we got off at the end, they, they give us, a, they, like, toast us with champagne and shit. Yeah, it was hella tight. They <laughs> give us, amazing. like, our certificate that says we're, like, a certified fucking hot air ballooner, you know, and then uh, give us our fucking glasses of champagne. Yeah, it was super dope. There's, like, a picture of us toasting with the champagne. It's pretty fire. <laughs> nice. And... Like I mean, you said when you you got the the message or the call to do it, you were in straight away, and like yeah. I can imagine that it's a similar situation with pretty much anything avocado suggests, right? Like the oh, guy absolutely just... for sure. I know the quality is going to be there. I love. I mean, Avo's a great homie too, and I'm just more than happy to like chill and work with the guy any any opportunity I get, and like you know, it's going to be some like wildly unique experience and for me like i'm all about that shit at this point i there's there's so much that i have seen and done especially in just going through the battle rap motions like so many so many events that i'm booked for you're going through the same basic motions you know what i'm saying and like seeing the same handful of people essentially so being able to do something completely unique to all of that while still being able to like provide the content i'm all about that shit and avo has had like ideas for other like locations that he still wants to do and stuff i told him like come up with a name for it and like make it an actual series you know yeah agreed that would be amazing and reason not to i mean they did that like the sand dunes in mexico with pigsty and and random the fucking the like all black drop studio battle that he did with like human and ronnie and reverse and geechee those ones like that, any of that shit he what he wanted to do he's, he's had an idea for like the last two years avo wants to go to iceland and film a battle on top of this dormant volcano in iceland <laughs> 
amazing. Yeah, and I told him, I was like, well, if you need a guy, you know, if you need someone who you know is going to say yes 100% of the time, holler at me. <laughs> like, I will absolutely do that. Definitely, yeah, that would be incredible. And just Avocat, his ideas in general, like the, the man has revolutionized battle rap. Like, he's, oh, sure. he's the guy. Like it's done incredible things to this scene. The MVP and... is the MVP of battle rap. Yeah, sure. agreed. So, the guy does so he works so fucking hard, and you can still tell that he loves what he's doing, which is the best part. Like he does. I'm sure he occasionally feels like overloaded with work and whatnot, but he still enjoys the process, and is still a genuine fan of the culture which is why he's happy to be the pillar that he is, you know? It's so great. Shout out to Avo. Definitely, man. And um, you mentioned pigsty a second ago, which kind of leads me into the next question, really. So what's left for you? What do you still want battle-wise? I know you want Iron Solomon. Um, yeah, to be honest, I'm, I'm pretty over the Iron Solomon battle, if I'm being honest. I feel like... Yeah. I feel like... I I can only have said yes to something for so long while the other person says no to where eventually it just makes me not want to do it anymore either. Like they've King of the Dot alone has tried to book that battle minimum five different times, probably more. It's probably like eight or nine times. I'm probably underselling it, but it is definitely a minimum of five times. Both town business events, multiple Toronto events, Two Boston events. They've asked him, I don't know how many times, and and every time it's the same answer. And every time they tell me, yeah, we're going to try to get you and Iron for this event, I say, that's cool, but have a backup plan because he's going to say no. And that's what happens every time. So I'm not going to hold my breath for it. It's, I mean, it, it would have been cool to make happen for the fans who wanted to see it because I feel like there are so few battles left with that sort of, like, historical value to it it's uh it, it would be something we would be doing like for the og core fans type of shit and that was the only reason i even wanted to do it in the first place was for the og fans like definitely no man it's, it's, it is it's a like shame. the last big big battle i had left on like my radar other than that now it's really just i want to see new places and uh, have fun in the process. You know what I'm saying? I'm I'm not like super picky about opponents. There's probably people I would like say no to battling and whatnot. But I mean, it's mostly like I want to go to new places that I still have yet to see while I still have the uh, ability and opportunity to do so, and while I still feel like I can compete at a high enough level to like bring them the show that they deserve to see. Um, places like New Zealand I still want to do I always wanted to battle in South Africa although I don't think there's much of a league there anymore unfortunately I could be wrong but I know that not a lot has happened out there with battling in a while but I know they still have battle rappers there Um, Jin I had reached out to me like years ago about getting me out there and it's something I would still love to make happen if there was any way um those are probably like the top two countries, New Zealand and uh, South Africa. Uh, I would like to do one more two-on-two two at least. I, I, I feel like I would I would probably like to do me and Ill versus Shuffalo in England if it's possible to even make happen before I stop battling. It was really close to happening last year i know but yeah uh, unfortunately some other people had nothing to do with the league it had nothing to do with us or shuffle it's just unfortunate how shitty some people are that their own like selfishness and irresponsibility then fucks with the league's future events type of shit you know what i'm saying that shit's fucked up man 100 percent. because we were um, I mean, we we were it was confirmed it was, it was gonna happen. Like, I still have the fucking WhatsApp combo. It's, it was gonna happen. Last year, it was gonna happen at the All Star. But I don't think the UK fan base were aware that it was ever booked, and 
Briggs, he actually did tell me on, on the show when I had him on, and yeah. it is, like, for someone who followed Battle Rap this long, I think it is the the number one matchup That's that I've right. ever wanted to see, and it's heartbreaking. And I feel here. like it should, like, not the UK, Ilmac and I have never done a two-on-two in the UK, so I feel yeah. like that that's also a, a cool thing and the uk is the only other place besides like cali where i think he and i would even do a two-on-two to begin with and obviously that just stems entirely from like the history and and our awareness of like the role that the uk had in uh you know basically our, our us like building our legacy as a two-on-two team we, we know that there's the only other crowd in the world who would appreciate it as much or more than the bay area crowd would would be the uk for sure because you guys have known what's good since the beginning you know and obviously if there's any team that we should be battling it's those guys you know a hundred percent yeah and it's it it has to happen at some point so I agree. Well, uh, I think it will. I think uh, I think eventually it'll it'll have to happen. Yeah, definitely. But the reason that I, I said pigsty is I had pigsty on the show too, and yep. he is again one of the most underrated for me. He is um, probably the most underrated in the world in battle rap. You two, I want to see you two battle in Vancouver. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was closer than you think, too. <laughs> Let's just say, if uh, if no pandemic had had started, that would that would be something that there's a chance you might have seen by now. Oh man, yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Uh, that was uh, yeah. We had talked about it for a long time, but it was uh, yeah. I mean, if the pandemic wasn't preventing travel and and gatherings of any type you know it's something that would have already happened it's and that that to me is uh like maybe the toughest challenge i've had I, i'm trying to think of who he is the toughest challenge since or it's for me, like who i can even think of that I battled before him that would push me to the same degree just because of how good he is at writing. He's so fucking mean too. Like as a battler, he's like one of the nicest people on earth. Stu's the fucking man, such a chill dude, but he is such a mean battler that <laughs> I would have to, I would have to be, but like, I feel like Bender is the last time I was that, aware of what i was up against to the degree of i can't slack for a sentence type shit okay and and before bender it was probably nasty so it's that like that's the that's how high a regard i i hold pigsty in as far as a battler he's definitely as much of a threat as as either of those two legends who i just mentioned as his writing is so thorough it's funny and witty and hella fucking mean it rhymes perfectly he does everything like really well i think to, like he to me i would say he's like the most underrated because he's so much more under the radar even than like a nestle you know what i'm saying like yeah. p- people people know who ness is even like the url audience they know who ness is like general fans and whatnot pigsty is very much more under the radar and like if you're an ryd head you know who he is if you're a kotd head you probably know who he is especially if you like watched uh if you were like a kotd fan several years ago you probably have a better idea of who he is because i'd say some of his best battles are like his soul battle is like probably like to me maybe his best overall battle and probably the one that most likely like fans have seen and shit you know yeah Definitely, and Soul. I, I I need to see you in Soul at some point. Yeah, that was that was supposed to happen a couple of times at the bunker, but timing wise, it just never worked out. I remember there was one time it was like super close. Oh, when I when I ended up battling Verb, initially it was going to be Soul, but there was something he was 
he couldn't leave for I think he was sick like I think he was genuinely ill uh, to where he just couldn't travel and leave the country type of thing um, and couldn't commit basically because he was like yo I don't know how long I'm gonna be out of commission definitely not in the mindset to prepare type of thing um, and we were always just like well it's cool we'll just make it happen at a future date you know what I'm saying and that was before uh, unfortunately the bunker had to close so the bunker was like one of the best things to happen to battle rap in recent memory before ruin your day happened i would say the bunker was like the best thing to happen to battle rap pre-ruin your day in a long time and yeah. uh, that would have been the perfect atmosphere for he and i to battle aside from again aside from the uk that's i feel like there's only two places i would ever battle soul and it would be cali or the uk or i mean if something like i guess scotland's technically the uk as well if someone if I've been contacted about battling in Scotland, not to battle Seoul specifically, but to battle in Scotland. And I would battle Seoul there too. I remember seeing when he and Real Deal battled in Scotland and just how fun, that crowd energy, man. It's the the energy of the of a hungry crowd who doesn't get to see it all the time. So you can tell how appreciative they are of the moment and shit. And uh, that would be the type of atmosphere I would, I would love to battle Soul with him for sure. Hundred percent, yeah, and it's it, that event in particular. The the atmosphere was electric, so oh be man, good to see. so crazy! Didn't that's where BA battled Tony, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They hit me up actually. The person who hit me up out there to come battle out there was to battle BA, which I would do for sure. Mm. Just because that's like something that. It's literally over a decade in the making at this point. That for that battle was first booked in like early two thousand nine. Okay. I think, I think the first blood in the water, and I was supposed—I don't know who the fuck I thought I was, but I was supposed to go battle in the same day. Respect the A, Archaic, and Truth. <laughs> Oh my god. I don't know who I thought I was. I just thought I was the most invincible human on the planet. But unfortunately, I couldn't make it. That was when I uh, had a family emergency and I couldn't make it. And I believe that was when uh, Madness and Dirtbag Dan made it over there. And then Madness battled Kulez. And I think Dan and O'Shea battled, if I'm not mistaken. That's it, yeah. Yeah. I was supposed to have three battles the same day. On that. Like, I was. it was supposed to be... I battle one of those guys, like one of my battles, then Dan versus O'Shea, then I battle again, then Tony versus Kules, then I battle again. <laughs> I don't know who I thought I was kidding. And the crazy thing is, like, up until the point, I had to cancel, I believe, like a week before. And up until that point, I had like seven of the nine rounds that I needed, which was crazy to even think. Like, but that was also in a time where I, I was just hungry to write at all times. And I was just thinking in battle at all times. And it was like, well, if it comes to my head, like, I'm going to create something out of it. I'm not going to let all this fucking shit go to waste, you know? No, I understand that, man. And it's, you know, it's 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 a shame that it's been tough for you to get over here since that point, too. But we're working There's... on it. We're figuring it out. I feel like, like obviously, if uh, if we can work out the two on two, it'll definitely be under the contingency that I have been okay to come through. That I either have like the legal temporary visa that I need, and I think those are only like two hundred bucks. So whatever, that shouldn't be hard to handle. And uh, I, I definitely want to be sure before attempting to come over that i'm not going to have any issue so i think the only way to even do that is just get the necessary paperwork just so if my name even comes up like when they swipe my passport you know because that's what happened the times that i got stopped they just they swipe it and oh what have you been stopped here before oh i was denied entry for this reason before Oh, but you're not here for that now no okay like i'd say no and they're okay well let me contact the person who like you're staying with and then they would hit up her and usually end up not liking something that her had to say <laughs> which is understandable um but well, the one i remember the most recent time i got denied was 
he and I had come up with a plan because it was for a, it was for like the fourth birthday event. So I was like, oh, okay, well, then when I land, I'm just going to tell customs I'm here for a friend's birthday. So when they call you, you just tell them, yeah, I'm there for your birthday. And you're using the and the event birthday is is your quote unquote your birthday. You know what I'm saying? So I land, tell them who my contact is and and who and that it's his birthday and that I'm staying with him. So what do they do? They call Rowan, and the first thing they ask him is what his birthday is, and he tells them his real birthday, which is like six months apart from the the event birthday <laughs> you oh know my God. so they're just like all right have a nice day and they come back to me and they're like yeah your friend says that his birthday is in october and it's april or whatever the fuck it was you know what i'm saying <laughs> so instantly just get denied right there incredible like, that was the oh time where uh, where daylight had to like stay in a cell overnight too yeah yeah i remember that and it's like for me personally, I've I've only had the chance to see you battle three times, like in the building, and twice was in the same day. Um, so, uh, your your battle with Matter was actually the first battle event that I ever attended. Oh shit, that's a great first event. Yeah, yeah, Holy I. Uh, shit, I will get you addicted right away. What the fuck? That is one of that's still to this day. That's one of the most electric atmospheres i've ever experienced for any battle event ever definitely well like shoddy arsenal i've never felt a crowd energy like that before still to this day since have never felt that type of energy that was the fucking craziest shit ever man yeah i i flew back from sweden especially for the event too so flew back on the thursday night and then flew home again on the monday morning um and it was just i was only i think i was only 18 at the time too so it was it was an insane weekend for me to be uh, honest so i loved yeah. it but i uh also got to see you in amsterdam <laughs> oh Amsterdam was fucking awesome amazing yeah like I don't know if you'll remember, like I was, we had quite a long conversation there. Actually, I was the, the, the guy that was, I was living in Germany at the time. So okay. and, like I was only about three hours away from Amsterdam and ended up booking like an apartment there for a week. Like I booked the entire week off work for it. Cause at that point that was still only the third event that I'd ever attended. So Word. It was a pretty big deal because I'd yeah. lived overseas for so long, like a big deal to to get to an event and stuff. And my my I think we walked home the night of the event pr- together because my apartment was actually like around the corner from where you guys were. Word, oh. But uh, yeah, I mean, another amazing event, right? Oh, that was so much fun. I wish that uh, Ur would have been able to make that a, at least like a yearly thing. We talked about doing another one. I was There was a point where I was supposed to battle Tony out there, actually. And, uh, fuck, I would absolutely love to still do that. No question. <laughs> I've wanted to go back there since then. That was such a fun, wild trip. Fucking Dan eating the truffles and whatnot. I remember smoking like the biggest spliff I've ever seen in my life with Big J. Just me and Big J just fucking puffed this gigantic fucking cone that he came like walking down the street with. And that, that was like me. That was mine and Big J's entire interaction for like the trip it was just we smoked like a 10 gram cone and then just went our separate ways. <laughs> Yeah, that was a, an amazing event, to be fair. And uh, oh, so much fun. I love that uh, that Bagno and Freddie were there too, man. Fuck. Yeah, the good old days in that sense. But sure. yeah, I, I got to see Freddie in Ireland though, which I was very happy about. At the he came through to just the the event in February, 
uh, him and Laura Jarvey came through, and those are like two of my favorite humans in the UK. And uh, yeah, it was dope as fuck to get to catch up with Krugs because uh, I've always been a big Kruger fan. Just as a human, he's such a cool, he's such a chill dude to begin with, such a good person, but he's such a uniquely talented individual. Like the things that he's able to do, not even just the, like how he raps he's su- like his rap style is super unique and he's always been fucking dope but his video editing skills his fucking he's a super interesting dude when it comes to just like his wealth of knowledge of music and shit so, i've fucking got so much love for crew man shout out to Kruger. yeah me too man he's a he's a great guy and yeah he's another another battle man that uh on the same all-star card where you and Shufflo nearly happened, he was uh, apparently very close to locking in his return against Pat Stay as well, which... Wow! Oh, my God! I know. I didn't I know. know that. That's crazy. They were trying to get Pat over, and apparently the only guy that Pat wants over here is Kruger. That's um and I don't think that's, anyone that's cool expected it. Because you know it. it's for a reason. Like it's because you know Pat has thought of some stuff that he thinks is gonna go over really well, and that's fucking awesome from a fan's perspective. Like when a battler wants to battle someone specific, it's for a reason, and usually the reason is the material they've been thinking of. But then you all like it would have also brought Krugs back, and that's such a good like. They're, they counter each other so well. I think that would be unexpectedly like an insane classic battle. Yeah, it really yeah. would. Because like Kruger is, they're sort of almost opposites in like demeanor and whatnot. But I feel like Kruger's like subtleties combat Pat's like larger than life shit so well. Man, that would be an incredible battle. Yeah. I'd love to see that too, but yeah, another one that was unfortunately lost. I, I don't think Kruger, I, I never expected to see him return. I don't think he's he's really on it whatsoever, but to hear that that was nearly locked in was exciting. Like, I really hope it happens at some oh, point in the near I would future. Love to see Kruger coming back to for one more battle in general, I would be very happy to see no matter who it's against. Yeah. Me too, man. But like, there, there's two other battles that immediately kind of jump out for me that I'd still love to see you do, and they're they're both a little bit left field, I guess. But I'd really like to see you and Terminal on Rap is Full. Erd. Oh, I would battle Terminal for sure. Um, I had a line that sort of shouted him out when I battled Nugget. You did, and uh. I really enjoyed hearing. I wasn't at the event, unfortunately. I was meant to be, and it got cancelled like three days before, and for a really shitty reason as well. I was basically like meant to start a, a new job that week, um, and due to the the current situation, that's been pushed back, and I've still not even started. So, yeah, it was gutting, but. Yeah, here in terminal's reaction too, man. Yeah, I know, man. And it's hopefully him and Tony still happens too, because that'd be amazing. But agreed, agreed. Matt from Rappers Full wanted to. I know there was at one point this year he was telling me. I mean, he even told me at the the event that he wanted to book me and Tony out there, which I would absolutely do. I'll, I would. I'm Tony's like. I feel like that's one of. He, he and Soul are like really the only mandatory UK battles left for me type of shit, you know. Like there's other ones that I would entertain if people wanted to book them, but those are definitely the top two guys over there who I feel like I probably have to battle before it's all said and done type shit, you know. Yeah, yeah. no, I can see that definitely. And uh, the last battle, you might not even be aware of this guy. I'm not sure how how big he he is really but there's a guy on that battles for i battle kind of specifically that i feel needs a big look um no it's sean o'shawn 
Oh, Sean O'Shawn is dope. Yeah, I know who Sean O'Shawn. He battled Real Seek, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's nice, man. He's really nice. Yeah, that was one of my favorite battles of last year, man. I, I think oh, he's. Oh, that's a crazy battle. Yeah. Yeah, he's... yeah I, I mean, if Lex hit me up about that, I would absolutely consider that shit. Sean O'Shawn is dope. Nice. Yeah, he's he kind of had a big look booked. He was meant to battle Glue Easy. Um, and then it got blocked or some shit. I, th- I think he just no-showed him twice, unfortunately. But, oh, wow, that's trash. Yeah, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that. I'd just love to see Sean get, his, get the big look that he's kind of deserving too so agreed and i mean for yourself any opportunity to battle an eye battle crowd with an eye battle crowd is is good right oh yeah i love that crowd it's such a like it's a very educated battle crowd. it reminds me a lot of like the bunker in the atmosphere it's like mm. battle heads that are there to listen and they they want to react to bars. They get all the inside references. They understand the backstory to all the lines. If you make a line referencing another battler or another battler's line or something like that, they get it. They're in tune with the culture. And that shit goes a really long way. It honestly does. Especially when an entire crowd gets it. That shit is dope as fuck. That whole energy out there, it's like... It's just like a group of like good homies. Everyone's just chilling and like drinking and smoking. They've got a barbecue, gr- like a grill going outside of the venue. So there's someone cooking food so you can stay fed, which is often a concern at events. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just feel like the whole atmosphere out there is so good. And all of the battlers on the roster are hungry, which is tight as fuck. And they're also very unique. It's not a bunch of people who all sound the same because they're from the same region. It's a whole, a wide cast of characters who all sound completely different than each other. And that shit is dope to me because I mean, for so long we were hearing, you know, so many of the same carbon copy of styles that it gets so redundant, but now you just have all of these like refreshing new heads who are dope, like, creating their own lanes and don't sound like each other and don't sound like other people either. I fuck with that. Definitely. And for myself, like they're, they're the league that I probably follow the most right now because I I feel like they don't release a bad battle, but agreed. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that is. That's definitely a good point. They like Lex sets up good matchups to begin with. And then Pretty much every release that they have, it's gonna entertain you. Like, you know, he he's a, a Lex is a really smart matchup maker. He definitely knows what the fuck he's doing, and he he knows like the right type of challenges to give his people as well. You know what I'm saying? Hundred like, percent. Shit that's not gonna overwhelm them, but is going to be a good look for them and is also going to bring something good out of the person giving the shot. You know what I'm saying? That shit is, like, he, he's really smart. Lex knows what the fuck he's doing, man. He's really smart. Agreed. Yeah, and uh, for myself, like, I, I've just started battling. Um, oh, good for you. That's dope. It's something that I've wanted to do since day one, but due to living abroad and life getting in the way, like, oh, it's sure. never happened. But I've... Uh, I'm in the the Premier Battles Academy this year. Sick, um, good for you. What's your uh, what's your stage name? Sir Spence. Okay, D- Sir Spence. That's tight. I like it. Thank you. I've had a lot of hate on it actually. So is your name Spencer? Lewis Spencer. Yeah. Oh, that's you. Okay, word. Dope. Yeah. Yeah, man. So. Oh, that's a tight name, bro. Don't let anybody give you shit about that. That's a good name. <laughs> especially especially because uh spencer if like if you just if it was just a play on words but your name was like jay arnold or something then it would be kind of kind of weak but with it actually being a play on your last name too yeah man that's tight thank you i'll take that thank you but uh, yeah i'm i'm my plan is to to obviously win this academy this year because the winner gets a spot on the apex card at the end of the year. Dope. 
And then as soon as the academy's over, the first thing I plan to do is get myself a battle on iBattle because I've still never been to America either. So, oh, wow. Got to make the trip then for sure. Yeah. I'm, uh, my plan is to come over for the first time. It, it, I've originally been saving to have made it to Town Business 3, but it may. It looks like that might now be blackout time-wise. Word, yeah. It, yeah, depending on when, uh, when it, when everything, like what timeline we we end up being given, basically. Yeah. So, I'm hoping to come over for that, and then, yeah. I mean, just getting on I Battle would be incredible. Just cause I've I've pretty much had the entire roster on the show now too. So. Oh, that's so, fine. That's yeah. It's definitely something I'm aiming towards personally, but amazing to see you and Marv battle there as well. Oh yeah, I think that's like that ended up being the perfect perfect atmosphere for, for it because of what I had said about I Battle Crowd being an educated battle crowd who is appreciative and understanding of literally all the history. You know what I'm saying? It's uh, if it wasn't gonna happen like in the bay where we tried it to, then I'm glad that it got to happen on either. Shout out to Lex for being like proactive about that one and just being like, he, I remember him just randomly one day making a post. He's just like, somebody shoot me a few wrecks so I can just book Marvin Thesaurus before someone else does. And I was just like, yo, this dude's the fucking man. He's just out here making shit happen. Just speaking it into existence. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Super and, uh, fire, man. I'm I'm happy with how the battle came out too. Shout out to Marv. I I did a an interview yesterday on Quest McCody's podcast. So shout out to Marv and Quest. But uh, I'm I'm really glad that we finally got to to make it happen. And I would say I I even said it on Quest's uh, podcast yesterday, and Quest said the same. Like, we we definitely we had our battle, which sort of like I guess can close that chapter, but if anyone were to ever reach out wanting to make that two on two rematch happen, like it's not something that I would be opposed to if, uh, if everything sounded right, you know what I'm saying? And quest said the same thing. He's like, yeah, like we can consider the chapter closed unless someone is like, Hey hey guys, I've got like a, a, an overwhelming pile of money for you to do this, this rematch. Then yeah, we'll do it. Absolutely. Like, if the situation is right, we, I think it would still happen. That's the all. I think that's maybe the only other two on two that would even be on the radar, unless by some whim, like URL reached out about like a, a double impact. And I don't even. I don't expect that to happen or anything. But if it did, I mean, it would depend on what team they would want us to battle, of course. There's a bunch that would make no sense for us to even battle over there. But, if it's not Twerk and Shirk, I'd be angry. Yeah, I mean, Marvin Quest, what, what I guess, is in theory could happen there, too. True. I would be, I'd be surprised if it did, though, because I wouldn't say URL has, like, pushed those two necessarily as hard as, like, some of their other guys. You know what I'm saying? Mm. But in that regard, I also wouldn't do a two-on-two against, like, like uh, steams and chess or something, you know what I'm saying? Something random where we have no history. There's nothing there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, NWX, maybe. That's that's maybe the only one that makes any sense. Or loaded hollows, but I I'd be shocked if they tried to book that. You know? Yeah. So those are like two marquee names. And while I think that we could. Uh, give either of those teams a, a very interesting run, I, I would be surprised if uh, that platform was trying to make it happen. Yeah, no, that, it would be good to see, and especially a rematch with Quest and Marv as well. Like I I was about yeah. to say I'd, I'd really like to see you and Quest battle one-on-one, but the two-on-two yeah, would be that, even better. That, uh, I feel like by battling Marv, that chapter closed. Yeah. That's fair enough. You know, there was, a, I, we even talked about in the Quest interview yesterday about my interview on Angry Fan, where <laughs> Quest tried to like bum rush the interview, and I just like 
fully roasted him <laughs> the entire time. It was super <laughs> funny. Legit, like, hooked him. Marv is, like, messaging me while the interview is happening. He's like, for the love of God, make it stop. <laughs> I'm just... I was just roasting him to no avail. And he was basically saying, like, you're never going to come to Detroit and battle anyone unless it's me. And I was like, nah, like, that's not the case at all. <laughs> you're not going to dictate who I battle. It was a f- super funny exchange. Um, but I feel I don't think we would ever one-on-one battle. I think the only thing that makes would ever make sense for any of us at this point, if it ever, you know, if it ever got brought up, would be to just rematch the two on two. No, I can understand that, and uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there there was a new a new league that kind of it it, it seemed like a very battle of the brave situation all over again, unfortunately. But there out was there? meant was to a be a league, league yeah, over here called the platform that okay. were. They were kind of promoting an event that they were meant to meant to do, like around around the end of last year, I think. Um, and it just never happened. Unfortunately, it fell through again due to booking the wrong people. Um, do you know who was in charge of the league? So I don't. To my knowledge, Rivers, the battler, was very involved. Okay, word. Um, I believe Snoop, who runs Gift of the Gab over here, was. Okay. But they've Snoop and are you aware of Tally, the battler? Yeah, I know who Tally is. Snoop and Tally are now starting a league called No Loose Chat instead. Um, Okay, I've seen that. And that's, uh, I feel like one of the people who runs that league was at the Ireland event. Okay, maybe Paris? Yeah, Par- yeah, she was there. Yeah, okay, that makes yeah. sense. And she's super cool. Yeah, yeah, they, I'm looking forward to see what they do. But the platforms, so they actually had some some really good stuff but that I was really interested in. And they, they had, they'd booked Marv 1 versus Joker Star. Oh. And Quest McCody versus Pedro. Wow, I love it. Yeah, me too. And anything, again, it fell Pedro, through. Anything, anything, bro. One of the Definitely. most entertaining personalities ever. Then that's Pedro's one of my favorite people too. Shout out to Pedro, man. That's my dog. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge Pedro fan, man. And Dude, I mean, home. I can't remember who else they booked now, but it was. Like it, it, it all just ended up falling through, very similarly to the whole Apex situation, unfortunately. But they were, uh, they looked like they were onto something great. But yeah, Quest versus Pedro was that's one awesome. of the most exciting announcements that I've ever oh, that's seen. Awesome. And Quest is, uh, I think Quest, Quest is a battler who will who would bring a really good energy back to someone like Pedro. It would make the battle so entertaining on both sides. Cause quest isn't just like some walkover, you know what I'm saying? Like he's uh, he's a, he's like the louder of the, of the combo of, of him and Marv too. So, Oh man, that would be such an entertaining battle. Yeah, definitely. I, it's just come to me. So the reason it didn't happen was because, Briz Rawstein and T Top pulled out. Oh damn yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I think Briz was meant to battle villain. Yep. And, and T Top Rivers. Because I heard that it was <laughs> I remember hearing that that was booked and I was like, wow, I wonder how much Briz finessed them for a deposit because there's no way he's gonna go battle villain. No. No, and it it's a shame, man, because Briz is one of the few URL guys that I, I really liked. Um, Briz is fucking dope. Yeah, huge fan of his, but I, I still want to see him back, regardless of all that weirdness that went on. But yeah, yeah. but I mean, yeah, and you, you mentioned wanting to go to South Africa as well. It's interesting, actually, I am. Um, 
I had someone on the show this morning. Are you aware of Blaine? Mm, I don't think so. So Blaine kind of came up through the last two years of scrambles for money. Um, and he he's okay. from Botswana. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, but he's he's actually been over to the UK twice because his first big look on scrambles for money was against Briggsy. Um, and wow. Briggsy ended up bringing him over here for... He battled Joker Star on Don't Flop, which unfortunately never the event never came out for some reason. Um, and he then battled Koji on Code Red. Okay. Um, but Blaine has just taken over a league in Botswana, um, and he's looking at getting. He wants to do a few local events over the next few months once once uh, the pandemic's over. And then he's looking at bringing a lot of people over there. So, fingers yeah. crossed, within a year or so, that's... Uh, That'll be crazy. Yeah. Yeah, Blaine's the man as well. Like, if you were if you were going there, I'd suggest battling him. He's, he's very good. Dope. Good to know. But, yeah. Yeah, fingers crossed that can happen soon, man. That'd be good to see because, I mean, it's kind of the only place left for you, really, that you've not been so far, I guess. Yeah, basically, there in New Zealand, I think, are like the top two. I've never been to Asia either. I, w- I would love at some point to, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think flip top is even much of a thing anymore, but. Uh, that was always something I wanted to do. I just want to see Asia in general. And uh, obviously it would be amazing if I could somehow make it happen via Battle Lab. Uh, but if not, then I just have to make it a point to get to Tokyo at some point in my life just because I need to see it. Um, oh, 100%. I was supposed to battle in or for Flip Top. There was like two different times they talked about getting first they talked about getting me and Ilmac out there and we probably would have battled protege and enigma and then they wanted to just get me out there just to battle loony um but for, for whatever reason it just never fell into place unfortunately i would still to this day if they reached out i would absolutely love to do it i've never been anywhere in asia and, right uh, I feel like if I made that trip, then I would just make it an extended trip and I would do some hopping around. Like if I flew into the Philippines, I would then like go from, from there to somewhere else, you know, probably go from there to Japan or maybe even to Thailand since it's so much closer. And then uh, just doing some hopping around, you know? Definitely. Yeah, I, I'm lucky enough to have spent a month in Thailand last summer and it was it's incredible over there, man. So definitely. So like... Out of where's left for you, they're three amazing places. So fingers crossed, they they happen soon. But oh, I'm praying they do. I mean, I'm hoping that just the world returns to a, a a state of existence to where these things can even be reality again. You know, Fucking. true. Yeah, man. But I mean, even with just like gatherings of particular size and shit like that, I'm hoping that uh, events are still gonna be a thing. Think, like thriving events can still be a thing you know definitely yeah it's it's definitely going to take some time anyway but i mean the the final battle rap related question and this one is the one that everyone has found the most difficult to answer but if you were promoting your own event which you had unlimited funds to put together what matchups would you be booking? Like, what do you want to see from a card personally? Wow. I have to book that Ilmac first loaded Lux. Okay. For sure. I would have to book that. No, I don't want to see Cassidy battle ever again. 
I was gonna. I was trying to think of something <laughs> to bring. Con- trying to think of something to bring Conceda back, but that's like the only thing that makes sense, and I would never out of pocket pay for Cassidy to be on a card of mine. <laughs> Conceded uh, run to- nitty for me. Oh, see, okay, cool. Yeah, we could definitely do that. Con and Nitty, absolutely, we could do. It's Four like two k- eras of punches, isn't it? It really, and it's based, I would say, probably, you could make a case that it's maybe the two, it's two of the three greatest punches ever, with the third being the magic, in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. As far as just punchline battlers, to me, that's, those are the guys, you know. Uh, I would definitely book Twerk versus Pat Stay. I yeah, think that's, yeah, that's a that's a room shaker that needs to happen. We need daylight in some capacity with something he's going to take serious. So I'm, I mean, he's already in theory supposed to be battling Lux anyways, and I know that's the up. I would want to put daylight against someone where he's going to be maximum level daylight, but I do, also don't want to take Ilmax Lux battle away. Um. A day against Gaichi or something, but I don't really want to do that. I mean, that's kind of interesting, I guess. Like two, it's like two completely different versions of Crip. <laughs> 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 like completely different versions. I'd probably go Day Surf to be honest. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I see Day Wash Sue Surf. Uh, <laughs> I would want Geechee to be a part of it. I, I, I want to say, like, someone might... Like, Geechee and Twerk are, like, basically, like, the two biggest, like, superstars of this shit, kind of. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, that. I mean, it's re- that's really what they've done, is, like, launched themselves into superstardom. I want to see Geechee against someone like a, like a Lloyd Banks. Wow, Okay. <laughs> That's the right type of opponent for someone like Lloyd, because Geechee isn't overly complex, but he still has bars for fucking days. You know what I'm saying? But it's not the overly tryhard, super technical shit that, because uh, that would be interesting to see Lloyd Banks battle someone like that. No. It would I think it'd be interesting to see him battle someone like Geechee because it's someone whose authenticity he can't question. And it's really just like uh, a slug festival. It's it would also it would keep it to where like if you put someone like Banks against a Nitty or something like that, you're dealing with uh, I think too wide of a gap in just like technicality for the writing to where like general fans are just gonna would just ride with Nitty on it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, think I agree. That, Geechee is still like an absolute punchline machine, but it's it's not they're not overly done, you know. They're not like overly dressed up. They're much more at face value and are still like capable of being like knockout power punches and shit. I think that's like probably the most ideal matchup if someone like Lloyd were to uh, to come in and battle. Yeah, yeah I agree. I fire. And then. I would have to book a two-on-two. I don't even know who they would face, but I would want goods and clean paper as a two-on-two team against someone who takes themselves too seriously so that they could just wash them. Someone like NWX, maybe. Just so... (laughs) Okay. Just because... I don't know if I want to pay out of my own pocket to book. (laughs) They're they're a good two-on-two team, though. I would want. I just think that goods and and clean. I was talking about this with Quest yesterday. I think that goods and clean would be like such an invincible duo. That, but but to be most effective, it has to be against two people who take themselves too seriously. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I just I'm trying to think of who takes themselves too seriously, and whether or not I want them to know that I think. That they take themselves too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like goods and clean paper would be such a hard two-on-two team to beat if they were on their shit. Because it's like, 
just endless like s- swag and effortless coolness <laughs> and fucking <laughs> them telling you how little they care about you or the battle <laughs> it would just be so fire I think Tay Rock and Surf stand out on that front for me then because agree yeah I would that's yeah okay even if so even if Surf Battle Day I would still yeah that's the only reason I didn't say gun titles is because I had already said Surf and Daylight but yeah I any think, opportunity to see Tay Rock lose is good for me I think that's like uh, that's like the right style of team too that uh, to put up against like two guys like Good and Clean you know yeah. I think that they're they're the the perfect type of energy to combat, especially to combat what Rock does, you know. Definitely. Yeah, that would be fire. And then let's see if there's anything else that needs to be. I wouldn't mind seeing Oxymiron come back and do a battle, to be honest. Yeah. So like against someone like Dumbfounded. That would be amazing. Yeah. I, think that would I know be uh, Oxy is someone. I believe Oxy and Lux are the two on Shotty's list at the moment. Wow, Wow, Oxy and Shotty. I would book that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That that I would get, yeah. And then I would book something else for Dumbfounded because I would like to see Dumb. I know Dumb has been, like, sort of itching to make a return. Really? Well, he said something in an interview recently about how he doesn't think he's entirely done with battling. It would have to be something that makes sense, but that he doesn't think he's entirely done. I'm just wow. trying to think of who it would be, you know? It would have, I mean, it's got to be a pretty narrow list, I would assume. I'm going to be extremely oh, I know selfish. Was, oh, Roan and Dumbfounded. Okay, no, I do really like that, actually. I was going to say I'm going to be extremely selfish and say something that I think was meant to happen, but Word. Dumb versus Luna. Oh, shit. That would be crazy. I would love to see Luna battle again. Fuck. Oh, my God. Me too. He's so, like, <laughs> clever and... But not in... He's so clever in a non tryhard way. Like, his shit is just so naturally witty, smart, well put together. Fuck, man. He was so good against O'Shea. Yeah. Amazing. Like, so fucking good. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I got to see that live as well, which was, I think... That event looked amazing. Oh, apart from Michael White being there, it was incredible, but... Oh, my God, I can... Yeah, oh God, weirdest thing ever. Like, yeah, amazing event. Like, probably one of the best battles I've ever seen live. Yeah. Oh, I believe that. I believe it for sure. It's one. Of, it's like one of my go-to. Like, if I need a good laugh battles, that's one of my go-tos for sure. It's so entertaining. Yeah. But no, that's uh, that's an amazing card. To be fair, I'd. Uh, if I if I ever won the lottery, I'd give you my money to put an event on anyway. But I appreciate it. I will. If you know, if I if I ever win a, a mega lottery out here, everybody is gonna eat. That's for sure. Nice, like it, man. But like, I've been ending the show with a couple of like music based questions, and then three very random questions to finish off with. But like. With yourself, there's a, a few like music questions for you that I want to throw in because cool. your your music kind of got very underappreciated, in my opinion. Like I Thank find you. it happens with a lot of battlers too. But word, we get, of, I mean, battlers like get pigeonholed into you know can't make music or whatever the case may be. I had hella fun making my album, like the whole process of it. Shout out to Chase Moore and. Uh, like hippie sabotage for producing the entire thing those dudes are all fucking supremely talented and so easy and fun to work with it was just so chill just getting to like sit in the lab and and roll up and smoke with my good friends and fucking come up with uh you know ideas and and just beat select the whole process was so much fun i enjoyed it a lot i hope 
that eventually a, a time window will present itself where I'm like comfortable enough to be able to just like take three or four months off of everything I'm doing, take a, you know multiple several months off of poker, several months off of battling, just be able to focus on putting together one final like cohesive project because me and Chase always wanted to do a follow up. And it's just been hard. It's hard to to navigate with time and everything, and just having as much overhead I do, as much uh, having myself and a teenager to support as well. It like definitely doesn't make it easy. But if, uh, if I ever get the opportunity where I have like another nice tournament win or something like that, to where I can take the time off, I definitely want to record another project and make it like a full cohesive unit uh it's gonna be called no gamble no future and uh, <laughs> nice definitely that's we, we've talked about it for years it'll just it'll just come down to me having the, the time window to sit down and and actually work on it and get back in that whole mindset because it's definitely much different and way harder than writing for battles it's uh, yeah mostly just different but it's also it is a lot harder too especially writing like good hooks and stuff like that um but it's something i'm interested in doing again for sure once i have like the freedom to do so um people still i still get like random sales on my original album too all the time which is dope as fuck shout nice. out to everybody who's copped all i know is that um any of the digital platforms or if anyone has a hard copy we only press like 2,000 hard copies, but I know they still exist out there. Okay. Nice, right. And yeah, I mean, all I know is that is, I was recently going back through, Spotify kind of suggests your your top tracks from each year since you've had it. Right. Um, it's one of the few albums as a whole to have featured in pretty much every year, to be fair, so I'd love to see another, another, uh, another project from you, but I hope uh, I hope we can make it happen. Chase Chase still lives in LA, so that's it's pretty close for me. It wouldn't be hard for me to uh, to get over there and and just be able to chill and uh, post up and and really make it like a, a well thought out project. I would want it to have like a very cohesive feel to it, where one song sort of blends into the next uh, as far as the sound goes, and then conceptually try to have like a bit more consistency to it a, a, a little less like i'm dope at rapping type songs and more conceptual type shit you know nice and yeah but like my main aim with this podcast is is once i've kind of built the subscribers and the listeners up a bit because uh, we've still only been going for about six weeks now um Word. is i want to do a weekly show talking about battle as music more because it's always overlooked Dope. and there's there's like so it. many like musicians like battlers that are making amazing music like Agreed. chase moore for example that that oh. track that him pass and eddie i did that undecided track is yeah oh man amazing Chase is incredible i'm chase chase has always been he's a genius man that's why i'm so like I feel so fortunate to have a dude like that who's willing to even like make a song for me, let alone a full project. He the, and he like mixes everything. He he has such a good overall understanding of like music theory, and he's very underrated as a rapper too. Definitely, completely agree. I'm a huge fan of his, but like in terms of the the music based questions, like. It's difficult again, but if you had to pick your top three favorite albums of all time, what are you going with personally? Just in general, just like rap albums all time, or or music albums all time. Just music albums. Wow. Um, the Nirvana Unplugged album would definitely be a part of it. Okay, nice. Um, that was like one of the first albums that really got me into like taking playing music seriously um all balls don't bounce by ac alone is probably the the album that is like the most 
largely responsible for me even being a rapper. Okay. Nice. That's never come up before, so. And. Wow, what would the third one be? Oh. Man. I'm really leaning towards saying uh, Shadows on the Sun by Brother Ali. It's like one of the few. It's like an almost perfect album beginning to end. It's so fucking good. I and love the album. It's so good beginning to end, and the songs have like so much depth to them. It's, I mean, it's definitely like Ali's best work. That shit is incredible. And I don't want to give some typical like Jay Z's Black Album answer because as much as I love that album, which is like comprised of entirely all classics, I don't think I listened to it the same way that I did when I first got Shadows on the Sun, and I was just like blown away by the whole thing front to back it's such a good solid cohesive album there's no dry spots all i like all of the songs on it even still like to this day so i think that's pro- that would probably be number three the first yeah. two are mostly like based on like the influence they've had on me for sure like what they've meant to me oh, especially over time those are just like to me two timeless albums ac alone is like it, that was probably like my biggest influence as a rapper, period. Like him and I guess pro- the majority, like Freestyle Fellowship as a whole, had a lot to do with me getting into like rapping. But AC alone, more than the rest of the group, something like stood out to me that I connected with, or that connected with me, that made me like take it more seriously. Definitely. Sure. Without, and I've told him this like multiple times, which is crazy to me. That I've somehow like become friends with literally my biggest influence. Like that's just the world coming full circle. But even like the last time he was out here in Vegas doing a show, I like told, I, he was like, "Wow, it's crazy that you're here at the show, man. I was just watching your battle with Verb like before I came here." I was like, "That's insane to hear." And I was like, "Yo, real shit. Like, if there wasn't you, there wouldn't be me. Like, it's like in the." Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the, the TV series that's going on right now, The Last Dance, about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. I've and not yet, no. There's like a bit where Kobe is basically saying, like, yeah, when fans ask me, like, but would you beat Mike one-on-one? Like, who would win one-on-one So, and who's better one-on-one player and this and that? And Kobe's like, no, see, like, there wouldn't be a me without a him. So you don't need to group me in the game of being against him because what you see out of me exists because it was influenced directly from that. And I feel a lot of that like the same way with uh, myself and AC alone. It's just, we don't rap anything alike whatsoever. That was just the first MC to influence me. I guess that that made me want to like elevate myself and take it more seriously. It was the first one that I was like, "Fuck, I don't like, I don't just want to do this. I want to do, I want to do this at this level and have it be noticed." You know. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And with with uh, Brother Ali, like I completely agree. Like him and him and Aesop Rock in particular for me were like massive when i first discovered them like i'm giant fans of both so word okay and like out of out of homies and shit too like i don't i I don't want it to sound like it's on some real even if we weren't friends immaculate makes some of like the best music period to me or shit that just like connects with me uh he is the most like freakishly talented human being i've ever known when it comes to putting words together i've I've never seen anything like it and uh like regardless a lot of people think that it's it's largely because we're like homies and we have uh an extended successful history together that obviously we would be fans of or, or support each other's work type of shit, but he he is 
like even friendship aside that is one of the best rappers in the world to me and some of his albums i would put up there against just about any of my favorites because some of the things that the guy has said are just like the most profound and well put together lines that i've ever heard still still i mean shout out to Illmac, man. oh definitely and he's down the years, he's proved his versatility as well. Like in oh, the... God, he keeps improving. He's a fucking a wealth of knowledge. He keeps he keeps improving while at the same time continuing to want to learn. And you get so many people who have like a skill set like him who are as naturally good as someone like him who don't think they have to learn anymore and they get lazy. He this guy wants to like take in new information from whatever source or angle it may be and he wants to implement it into his craft and uh guy is just otherworldly alien level rapper it's uh, the way he thinks i've never seen anything like it it's insane man. definitely agreed and like for yourself then what's the what would you say stands out as the best live act you've ever seen in terms of like shows and concerts that you've been to probably the roots mm, okay tech nine puts on a really good live rap show every i've seen tech nine perform like not the battle weirdo but the actual rapper uh, yeah chill he uh <laughs> he puts i've seen several more than several tech nine shows and he puts on, I wouldn't say I'm like as big a fan nowadays of like the flippity dippity double time rapidy shit, but he does it at such an exceptional level. I can't like undersell his, his skill. And every time I have seen him perform live, I have left the venue reevaluating my own abil- abilities to perform live. And that to me, there's, uh, I, I'm trying to think of other artists who've had that level of impact. And for me to have seen the guy seven times or however many times it is, and every time I leave the show just going, I don't think I could ever do that live. That's like, it's, it's, it's genuinely that impressive to me. It's how perfect, perfectly choreographed the movements are along to how meticulously written his material is. The fact that he's not overdubbing anything in his verses, which are patterned in a very like non live show friendly way. You should double time isn't live show friendly material. That shit is so fucking hard to do, period, in a studio, let alone having to do live where you have even less control or I mean it's you're entirely reliant on your own breath control as opposed to being in a studio where you can punch in and out. It's fucking nuts what he does live. And the roots, what they do live, the way that they incorporate every act of the band to let the audience know. Basically, every member of the band gets like a 10 to minute, so, seven minute solo, six minute solo on like every single instrument. They introduce them by name and this is so-and-so. This is what they do. Give it up. Crowd gives it up. They do their solo. They they let the crowd know that it's not just about any one particular function of their crew. You know, it's not just about the MC as dope as the MC is, and it's not just about the keys as dope as the keys are, and it's not just about Quest Love as incredible as he is. It's about what they do as a unit, and then you get a little like showcase of how insane they all are individually, it is super fucking dope seeing a Root show live. They, uh, Can imagine. They put on a very special show. And I got to see them with Razel, which is even more next level, seeing like one of the greatest beatboxes of all time, who's also, I mean, he calls himself the fucking godfather of sound. The, <laughs> the, the show that he puts on alone for his solo it was like a war scene with fucking helicopters and explosives it was it was like they paint a picture for you it's crazy man i uh, forgot about razel i forgot he even existed yeah, that's yeah i don't remember him Razelle, now. the first root show i saw they had razel and they had scratch 
who is still a member of their crew. And Scratch basically mimics every single DJ sound that uh, like that DJs are making when they're doing cuts and whatnot. So what they would do for the live set was a show that was the Roots, Common, and Most Deaf. Common and Most Deaf were the opening acts. So they had for Rozelle and Scratch's like solo bit, basically Rozelle would beatbox a particular beat. Scratch would be mimicking a DJ, or Scratch would be mimicking the Scratch sounds that a DJ would be making while doing cuts. And then Common and Most Deaf were just standing on the stage doing like air DJ moves with their hands. And Scratch was mimicking everything they're doing with their hands, like how it would sound with actual turntables. It was fucking nuts, bro. It was so sick. They just put on like their own little miniature live concert that was, that sounded like real beats too, because it's Rozelle, of course. And sounds like a real, it sounds like the fucking beat junkies are, are scratching on the cuts. It was so sick. And then it's just goofy ass common and most deaf just doing like air turntables. It was so fire. That's, yeah, that sounds absolutely incredible to be fair. And, uh, and then Rage Against the Machine is probably like the best live rock show. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'd love to see them too. You've seen some cool stuff, man. I'm very jealous, to yeah, be fair. I, I seen, I, fuck, man. I went to Lollapalooza. I went to the second ever Lollapalooza when I was I was 12 years old. <laughs> I was 12 years old, and my mom and her best friend, who and I was like good friends with the, her best friend's son, my mom and I just decided that it's a good idea. We wanted to go to this music festival that had like the Beastie Boys and Cypress Hill and fucking sonic youth and like parliament funkadelic all kinds of crazy shit that i couldn't have possibly appreciated when i was 12 all i was thinking about was fucking smoking weed and eating mushrooms and shit so our parents thought that it was an okay and safe and responsible idea to just drive us up to this outdoor venue with 75,000 people drop us off unsupervised while they went shopping in the city for the day <laughs> And then me and my fucking 12-year-old homie were just at this <laughs> insane festival where we just, like, you know, smoked an absurd amount of tree. We both ate acid. We both ate mushrooms. <laughs> we just <laughs> fried our minds off and then just got picked, you know, dropped off at noon and then picked up at 10.30 p.m. outside of the venue. <laughs> just like nothing had happened. Oh, it was insane. And we did that two years in a row, me and the same homie, when I was 12 and 13. And, I mean, just the amount of acts that I got to see in those two years on Lollapalooza. Because that, at the time, was the biggest fucking... It was like a, a reboot version of Woodsock, so to speak, except it was a tour, you know? Yeah. And it was fucking crazy. I mean, the, we got to see the Chili Peppers, fucking Metallica. <laughs> Sonic Youth, whole block, man. So many insane acts. Cypress Hill was dope as fuck, too. Cypress Hill was like the weed-smoking rap group at the time, so they, like, wheeled out a 10-foot bong on the stage to play the song hits from the bong and shit. It was dope. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's amazing. That amazing. was back in my punk rock phase. I used to, like, play guitar. I had dreadlocks, like, down to my shoulders and shit. Really? Yeah, oh yeah, I was a young little punk rock skater kid. <laughs> nice one. I could never imagine that, to be fair, but... It was wild. Legit, I looked like... Like, my hair wasn't super dreaded. My hair is hella, like, naturally wavy, but the back was definitely, like, almost all dreads, and then the front was just super long and wavy. But I looked like uh, like Jim Morrison on, like, a Doors album cover. Like, you know, <laughs> full-on like long mop top it's it's pretty funny actually nice i like it now that's a amazing list of artists as well man that's incredible but the the final three so these are extremely random the right. the first one i'm quite interested about so i've been asking people what their favorite sports team is and like i know you're a big boston celtics fan like big celtics fan oh yeah how come being from from California originally? Like, how come the Celtics? Dad was always a Larry Bird guy, 
and Correct. that pretty much just rubbed off on me. Larry Bird became the the guy that was the household icon, and then with liking the Celtics came liking the Red Sox too. Uh, but Celtics definitely like my favorite sports team for sure is the definitely the Boston Celtics. It's not even close. Right. So and you um based in Tampa Bay. That's uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm happy that we got Tom Brady now, so that's sick. And I used to be, I was initially growing up in the Bay Area. I was a 49ers fan. Um, but my favorite player, they basically like let my favorite player of all time go to a different team. So I just abandoned the franchise and lost faith, spent a couple years in limbo. And then like uh, a, a guy from like right around my hometown got drafted by the Buccaneers and drafted a couple other college players who I was a huge fan of. And I was like, well, shit, Trent's the new quarterback? Like, that's super sick. I'll become a fan just on that merit alone. And then they drafted a guy named Warwick Dunn, who was one of my favorite co- – maybe my favorite college player of all time. I was like, okay, we're riding with this now. We're a Buccaneers fan. Nice. Well, a lot of my friends weren't exactly thrilled. My dad definitely hated it. My dad's a diehard Oakland Raiders fan, always was. Right. Yeah, uh, I've um, very, uh, very recently become a giant like NFL fan. So Sick. we love that. It's not That's super. Ex- it's never been accessible in the UK, but like Getting last season. Now. Yeah, it's it's getting it's getting bigger here, but. Last season, they started uh, the NFL show. So on a Saturday night, we essentially have match of the day, which is the Premier League football soccer highlight. And then straight after that, now we have the NFL show that shows all the highlights from that week. Sick. Um, And I think it was the first NFL game of the season that's not long finished. I ended up just watching it by mistake from not turning the the channel over or whatever, and found out what I'd been missing out on and have become pretty not much interested. Obsessed. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Like, it's obviously not for everybody, but it's it really is a super interesting sport and far more technical than people really think it is when it comes to like play design and having all of your blockers in correct places and everything. It really is like a much more technical sport than people give it credit for. People mostly give it credit for being like the most violent American sport, you know? Definitely. No, and um, I don't know if you'll like this much, but I've become, I've, I've gone with the Chicago bears as my team. Okay. Fair enough. But yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not holding out for him to have a great season, but, yeah, I, I, to be honest, as a, a new fan, as, as someone who only got into it from the season that's just passed, Word. I kind of wanted to become a Chiefs fan because I thought Mahomes was the most incredible oh God, player I've so seen. Sick. He is so sick. There's a, but, there is a new wave of like young, flashy quarterbacks right now that are all so sick. Mahomes is one of them. Lamar Jackson for the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. To me, that, He's my current favorite player in the league. He like when I play Madden on my Xbox, the the NFL game, I I'm Lamar Jackson. He is the most electrifying player in in the NFL. Deshaun Watson is another one who plays for the Texans, and I followed him through his entire college career. Um, even Russell Wilson up in Seattle is like super mobile and still explosive. Uh, Chicago has got like a really interesting. They're basically, they have like a a dual, there's going to be an open competition for the quarterback job this year. It's between the guy who they, who they've had the last couple of years, Mitch Trubisky and the guy they just signed in the off season, Nick Foles and Nick Foles won a Super Bowl just two years ago with the Eagles. So he has like that championship pedigree, but he's far less mobile than the other guy. It's going to be an interesting uh, quarterback competition to see who wins the starting job. So I'm a, re- as I said, a relatively new fan, but for me, Foles takes that all day. I think he sh- should have the edge there because of what his like pedigree is. And uh, the guy Trubisky 
kind of took a step backwards last season uh, from from what his production was the year before. It looked like he was rest a little bit last year. Uh, I think Foles, Foles is also like a great locker room guy. He has the championship to, to back it up, so he, he can already like win over the confidence of his teammates. And then the Bears have like, Maybe my favorite defensive player in the league as well, Khalil Mack. He is so sick. Okay, yeah. There's like the Bears. That Bears defense is ready to win. That that's the thing about that team. If if Foles in the offense, if they can win games with their offense, they're gonna be a very dangerous team because they have the caliber defense that could take them to a Super Bowl for sure. Sure. Yeah. I I hope so. I'd love to see it, but. Especially with the, I don't know how true these rumours are, but apparently there's advanced talks going on for a Super Bowl to happen in London either this year or next year. Wow. Um, It will be it would be next year if it could. This year's is going to be in Tampa. Oh, okay. That. Right. Okay. But it wouldn't surprise me if London ends up winning a bid within the next two to three years. Would not surprise me at all. Because even the London games that they that the NFL does over there, they get they've gotten significantly bigger and more popular every year that the NFL has done them. And Definitely. I mean, there was even talks this last year when all of the owners and the players' union met to create like their new collective bargaining agreement. There was like preliminary talks of a potential team being added in London. But then they just looked at, they thought that the the travel dynamic would be too exhausting, especially on the London team, because you have eight games in your home city and then eight away games. And obviously, for a London-based team, all of the away games would be like a minimum long flight and large time difference, you know? Yeah. Logistically, it, it probably makes more sense to keep doing what they're doing, for now at least. And just having teams come over to, and then having London host the games. Definitely, yeah. But it is something I'd love to see happen long term. But yeah, I think it's there's a lot to figure out before it does, I guess. But no, it's interesting to hear about the Celtics, though. You know, I thought I always found it pretty uh, interesting that you you chose them as your team, just because oh, they're. Oh yeah, long as I can remember the Celtics I mean they, they must be from growing up in California they must be the the team that's furthest away from you as well well yeah besides like New York that and I would say because of being in California and the Celtics Lakers rivalry the Celtics were probably the most disliked team in California right yeah, that's probably pretty safe to say I think there's a stronger dislike that Cali fans have among the or towards the Celtics than the even towards the Knicks, and a lot of that too is just because the Knicks haven't uh, history hasn't been on the side of the Knicks as much as the Celtics. The Celtics are the winningest franchise of all time, the most championships, and they have just like such a storied rivalry with the LA Lakers. Yeah, so they're not a widely popular team, but there's still plenty of Celtics fans in Cali. They definitely still exist. Fredo is a Celtics fan, and he lives in Canada. They're, they exist all up and down the coast for sure. Nice, nice one. I definitely but... still, I still show support to like the Bay Area teams, or at least I did when I lived in Cali. Still, I, I always showed love for the Bay Area teams. And now that I'm in Vegas, I support the uh, the Vegas Golden Knights, the hockey team, and I'm sure I'll go to multiple uh, Vegas Raiders games now that the Raiders have moved out here. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, exciting times. But the next question, you might have answered this already, but if you could pick anywhere in the world for your next holiday or your next trip abroad, where would be top of your list? Oh, wow. It, well, I, I was uh, the trip was booked and I had to cancel it. It was uh, I should be there. What's today's date? The 15th. I should be there one week from today. I was supposed to be going back to Greece to go spend a couple of weeks in the islands before uh, the World Series of Poker starts. And uh, I used to, if I haven't been back in 11 years, 
I used to go to the same island every summer with a group of friends, an island called Eos, right next to Santorini, about yeah, 30, okay, 40 minute ferry away from Santorini. Santorini too, maybe the most beautiful place on earth. Um, but I had a friend, an English friend actually from uh, Chris from Bristol, maybe Bristol, no Sheffield. Friend from Sheffield called DJ Chris who owned and managed a club on the island of Eos every year. Basically the only hip-hop club on the island. Huge techno house scene in Europe, of course, especially with the clubs. And Greece itself has kind of a, a popular rock scene as well. So most of the bars and the clubs on the island are either all house music or like classic and 90s rock music. Right. Except for my boy Chris's place, which was the lone hip hop club on the island. And uh, basically, I would go out there, work for the club, either bartending or like uh, what was called a kamaki in Greece, which was basically you work the fr- you're like working the front door of the club, but you're trying to get people inside that are walking by because it's yeah. just like club, 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 club all next to each other, basically. So you're offering, you know, drink specials and free entry and shit. So I'd work for the club a few nights a week, and then we would perform a few nights a week. And it was the fucking illest experience of all time. That was where I performed. That's the island that has, like, the 4,000-year-old amphitheater that I did a set on and shit, which is just insane. And, uh, yeah, I was finally going to go back for my first time in 10 years. Hadn't been back since the summer right before me and Ilmac battled, so 2009. And, uh, cause I was, I was in Greece when Ilmac and I confirmed our battle with Lush and, uh, hadn't been back since was finally going to go. Like that was the first thing I did when I won that tournament right before the Ronnie battle, that poker tourney. First thing I did was book a flight and had to cancel it a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, and got fully refunded, which is fine. But, uh, man, it's disappointing to not be able to uh, to go right away and to have to probably wait at least another year, unfortunately. That's definitely number one spot on the list. It's just Greece in general, but particularly I would love to go back to Eos and Santorini more than anything. Nice, man. Yeah, I've, uh, I've done similar. So I'd, I went over to Ionapa in Cyprus. for. Oh, Cyprus is amazing, too. Yeah, I went there for a while and did like a similar job to yourself for a couple of months. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a cool time over there, man. But yeah, it's super fun. Just get paid in alcohol and and in food money. You know what I'm saying? It was dope, man. Yeah, simpler times, but so much. Sim- oh my god, the and it's oh, it was that was the best times of my life for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. And yeah, I hope that that trip happens to you soon, then, man. But um. It. The final one has brought up some some good answers, but some terrible answers so far. But if you could pick one sweet and one savoury, what are the go-to munches in your opinion? Wow, one sweet, one savoury. I'm, I'm a pretty big dark chocolate fan. Just like. Hershey's dark chocolate is really good to me. Oh, yeah, I'm with you 100% there. And then probably I really like jalapeno chips. I think that would be the opposite side. Something like that. Crisps. Jalapeno crisps. (laughs) Yeah. No, I like it, man. They're good answers. And uh, as I said, they're, they're definitely some of the better ones that I've had so far anyway. I've had... Somebody said, uh, well, are you aware of LS Dean over here? Oh, yeah, I know who that is, yeah. Yeah, he, he said chocolate-coated raisins, which I thought was oh, going to be very difficult to beat. I remember being mad at getting those, like, on Halloween when I was a child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, anybody who's giving away fruit or candy-coated fruit is just not hitting Halloween the right way. <laughs> yeah. I remember saying to him at the time, like, when you're a kid and your mum hasn't been shopping for a week, 
and they're all that's left in the cupboard. That's what you go for. But apart yeah, oh from yeah, that, because you don't have an option, and you just are kind of craving something sweet. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but then I don't know if you'll know what this is, but Jolly J said uh, Marmite Twiglets. So that like do you know what Marmite is? Yeah. Is it like yeah? Oh God, that's disgusting. Yeah, and it's oh. they do these like they're like pretzel sticks that are marmite flavored oh, uh, oh it's wow because yeah i've heard of like uh the sticks and then you have the marmite or the veggie mite which is almost like a jam that you dip the sticks into i've heard of that but i didn't know they actually made the flavor <laughs> like the stick in the flavor that's gross oh it's disgusting it is like marmite is my least favorite thing in the world so Oh, I was so foul. fuming when he said that, to be honest. But, yeah, I suppose he does live in Germany. They have some weird taste over there. So Fair. Makes sense. Each to their own. But apart from that, man, I mean, we, we've we gone now for just short of three hours. And it's, it's been amazing to chat to you. As I said, Brandy you are. conversation. Yeah, bro. I appreciate you having me. No, honestly, thank you very much, man. It's been amazing to speak to you. And uh, is there anything that you wanted to plug or anything or any links that you want in the description of the video? I mean, if you, you can just follow me on Instagram at Thesaurus Wins. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Gamble and Battle. Um, you Are you planning on... to keep this Twitter handle this time then? I definitely am. I lost it for a month, <laughs> like, like briefly during the the lockdown i like right when the stay at home order started for some reason my account got locked like i have no re no idea why still and then i i just kept emailing and appealing the suspension over and over and was just like look i don't know what's going on please just inform me i'll verify whatever info needs to be verified and then finally they just lifted the ban and they were like we're sorry we like suspected your account was a spam account but thank you for letting us know it's not so we should be good as long as i uh as long as i don't call any like verified american politicians cunts and things like that i think i'll be in the clear <laughs> and, uh, i've pretty much tried to just like void my timeline of even like seeing the majority of their tweets so that's made things easier and i'm trying to just be like on a more positive kick interacting in general trying really not to even like feed into or fuel any negativity uh if, if i can avoid it and uh you know stay stay more interactive with the people who have good things to say and i find that doing that absolutely keeps my account out of trouble or like away from risk of being banned you know <laughs> definitely it's a good plan man but yeah i'll include those for sure and uh Appreciate I'm it. actually I'm gonna convert the video and upload it straight away, so oh. it'll be out within probably about half hour or so. But perfect, just hit me on Twitter and uh, I'll fucking post it on all of my stuff. Appreciate it, man. But yeah, again, thank you very much for coming on, man, and uh, I thank hope you, you stay safe me. over there. Anyway, likewise, take care. Hopefully, I'll be over there sometime end of this year, early next year, and we can chop it up in person. Definitely. If not a uh, blackout, hopefully, man. Word, yeah, good shit. Hell yeah. Yeah, nice. But yeah, thanks again, man, and take care. You too. Right on, man. Peace.